the session is the session nine, advanced me methods. It's my pleasure to in in introduce Jonas Lat. Uh, he is uh, incredibly fa famous for uh, the really huge efforts uh, in the in the program pa Palabos, a wonderful li library for uh, Lattice Boltzmann uh, sim 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 simulation. And uh, the title of uh, the, uh, the presentation is uh, from CPU to GPU in 80 days. So please, thanks. Oh, stopped. Okay, yes, thank you, grazie. Thank you, so I'm honored by this presentation, by this introduction. And my talk is about uh, Palabos, actually. So uh, the title of the talk, it is the title of the project which we ran this summer, which took the Palapos library and translated it to, to GPU. So it is a bit of a special project because um, compared to previous attempts to port Palapos to GPU, which we did many years ago, now we used a more modern formalism, which is completely hardware agnostic. And in this sense, we can port very large por uh, portions of Palabos very fast with a team of people who are not really GPU people and are not into CUDA or other low level things. So the team which is involved in this project, you see it on the left here. And um, so our impression is that this is really a new way you can do things. Uh, uh, and there's this a bit of a new era in GPU programming. So this is why I want to present the project uh, from CPU to GPU in 80 days. And I think it, the experience is going to be useful also for other people and other Lattice Boltzmann projects. So first of all, thank you for being here in spite of the title, which usually is a little bit uh, scary because you know, when there is GPU in the title, you end up with codes like the one you see here. So this is a code uh, written in CUDA with, uh, by one of our programming, uh, uh, by one of, of our programmers. And myself, I don't understand the code completely because I'm not into CUDA. But essentially what you see here is, is the standard thing huh? where you have uh, the, the, these threads which you group to, to, to be optimal on the GPU and whatnot. So what I hear is that CUDA programming is not difficult per se. It's something people can do. But because of the technicalities of the code, you find that other researchers in your lab are not willing to take the code over and use it, uh, use it themselves. And then you have a maintenance problem. So when you have a code like Palabas, which has 400,000 lines of code, this is not a, an ideal model. But then what you have now is you have higher level programming approaches, like the one which is built in, in the C++ standard since uh, C++ uh, 17. This is called the uh, parallel algorithms. And the idea is you add an extra argument to standard algorithms, and then the algorithm just you know, runs uh, in parallel, for example, on a multi-core CPU, or if you want, it runs multi-threaded on an accelerator, uh, such, uh, such as a, a GPU. And uh, so the idea with Palavos is we took parallel, parallel algorithms and used them to add a GPU backend to Palavos. So as a Palavos end user, you just take your end user application like this one. This is a code extract for a, a problem which flows through Polis Media. And then you change a single uh, line of code to instruct Palabos to run the code on GPU. And this is a hybrid concept. So you can run pieces of Palabos on CPU and other pieces uh, can run on uh, GPU. The idea, and this is where the concept of parallel algorithms is crucial. We want to minimize code duplic duplication. So uh, at the level of the back end, CPU and GPU here, the same implementation of Lattice Boltzmann models. And then uh, we don't want to break existing Palabos applications. So at the level of the interface, things remain the same as well. Now, in the first part of the presentation, we forget about Palabos. And I just give you a quick overview of um, what parallel algorithms are. This here is a very simple code with two vectors, V and W. So vectors, that's the arrays in C++. And V is initialized with four data elements, one, two, three, four. The transform algorithm receives uh, both vectors. It reads from V, it writes into W. The, also, the algorithm also receives a lambda expression. 
that is an element-wise operation which you apply on every element of the vector. If you want this loop to be parallelized, you simply add an extra argument like the execution par argument which you have here, and then bam, it runs on a GPU or multi-core CPU. So if you want this to run on a GPU, you are going to compile this with the NVIDIA MVC++ compiler and uh, provide an extra compiler argument. And that's it. So it's a little bit magic. So how do you know if your code runs on CPU or GPU or anything else? The C++ language is hardware agnostic, which means it just provides a common formalism to express parallelism. Then you need a specific compiler or an implementation of the standard template library to run on the hardware or another one. There is, for example, here, the open source implementation, which comes from Intel, which is called the Threading Building Blocks, which runs uh, parallel algorithms on multi-core CPUs. And then you have the NVIDIA compilers, which compiles parallel algorithms to GPU. And then there are other backends, which we have not tested yet. So what you see here is a little bit strange because you see um, GPUs are heterogeneous systems, which means you have the CPU with the CPU memory and you have the GPU with the GPU memory and it's not the same memory. So how does C++ even know uh, in which memory you are working or if you work in both, how is data going to be transferred? Because within the C++ standard, you don't have like memory transfer instructions or I mean C++ does not even know about uh, details of memory. So for example, on NVIDIA GPUs, the answer is that there is a concept which is called unified memory, which provides common address space for CPUs and GPUs. Look at this code example here. You have uh, two calls to the algorithm for each, but the first one runs on CPU because there is no parallelization directive. And the second one starts with a directive. So this one runs on GPU. The unified memory model guarantees consistency between the two algorithm calls, which means that uh, implicitly behind the cell, behind the scene, data gets automatically transferred from the CPU to the GPU. There is a performance cost, of course, but the concept is amazing because when you port Palabos to GPU, for example, you just go uh, through the loops from one loop to the next one, and you just tran translate them from loops to parallel algorithms, and you have a hybrid code, parts of it, run on GPU, parts of it run on GPU, and the more you advance, more code you have on GPU, but it just always runs because there is a hybrid concept and the memory is really conceptually shared, although the hardware memory is not the same. So this is well, a very short introduction to uh, uh, parallel algorithms. And before I move on with Palabos, uh, I can maybe mention that we also provide an open source code, which is called STLBM. It demonstrates how to implement LBM codes with parallel algorithms. It's really short. On this example, which is a 400 cube cav cavity, this example is coded with just 600 lines of code, which are very easy to read, just stand C++. And it runs this example with a Reynolds number of 10,000. So this is turbulent. So in order to have sufficient statistics to compare with the literature, you need to run like half a million iterations. On the A100 GPU on which we ran this example, you get the result in less than three hours. And this is a problem for which typically you would need, you know, uh, many days on the full cluster. And now what you have is 600 lines of code which run this on one GPU in less than three hours. Um, so if you want further details about that, and I don't have time for that today, uh, you can just uh, download and uh, run uh, STLVM, it is open source. And uh, here is, a link also to a 40 minute presentation which gives all the details. And maybe at the end of this presentation, I will also copy these links into the chat so that you can copy them. I'm not going to do that right now because I have some issues with Zoom commands. So um, now part number two, which is what this talk is really about. Uh, how do you, do you port a library like Palabos to GPU using parallel algorithms? So by now, I think that you get the gist. Huh? When you have loops of grid cells, like in this code example, you just, you know, if it was on PNP, you would add a directive. But if this is parallel algorithms, you just take this loop and replace it by a for each call, a for each which goes over all elements and which has a function object. 
a lambda function uh, which calls the decode on every cell. Now, if you have a little bit of experience with GPUs, you know that this cannot be the full story, right? Because the GPUs, they really have a less general architecture than CPUs. So some extra adaptation to the code is required. But I'm going to talk about some of these adaptations. But my point here is these adaptations are going to be high level and they are not going to go into specific hardware details. So these are adjustments which are a little bit hardware agnostic. They are going to work for all the GPUs and those are high level things you can understand even if you are not into CUDA or all this low level stuff. The big problem which we have with Pados is that the library is too much object oriented to play nicely with GPUs. This is a choice which we made because we really want Pavos to cover many types of models and problems and uh, all the needs of the community. On the bottom of the screen, you have a representation of the mesh and every cell is represented by an object. So an object, what is that? That's something which contains data, which is the populations and some other extra information you, if you have some. And this is something already now GPUs don't like because with this model, you end up with a data layout, which is collision centric. And then uh, GPUs uh, break down completely because uh, they cannot handle memory accesses in the streaming step uh, properly. Then what you also have in a cell is you have uh, virtual functions to all the ingredients of the collision step. So this includes collision model, LES model, boundary completion scheme, and so on. This is how Palabos is polymorphic and really, Every cell can do uh, something completely different than the other cells. This again is no good for GPUs. They uh, don't like calling functions through function pointers. And actually, uh, currently virtual functions are not supported at all in parallel algorithms on GPU. So this is not going to work. It is not going to be performant. That actually, it does not work at all for now, okay? So what we do is we have a new data structure in Palabos which is more uh, GPU oriented. Traditionally, all the data in Parabos, you have this on the left of the screens, of the screen, they are in a structure which is called the multi-block lattice. And now we have on the right of the screen, we have the uh, accelerated lattice, which is uh, optimal for GPUs. It has a different mem memory layout huh? because that's what the GPUs want. And the virtual functions are replaced by cell tagging. So, Every cell has an integer tag, which identifies all the change, all the chain of algorithms which you are going to call. This tag matrix is built automatically by Palabos. Um, because in Palabos, you have some built-in type identification, which is um, usually, usually we use this uh, runtime type identification. We use this for um, serialization of data through, through the network or to check checkpoint the simulation or whatnot. But now we reuse, that, we, we reuse that mechanism to identify in runtime what ingredients are in the multi-block lattice and we assign them to a single tag which uh, puts all that code together assigned to a tag in a tagged simple matrix. And then you have a simple data structure which is uh, ready for GPU, okay? And then we also need to change the data layout. And this is, this is something you already know. If, if you have been working with GPUs, you know that, okay, in Palabos, traditionally you have an array of structure, which means that all the populations assigned to one cell, they are uh, consecutive in memory because they are encapsulated inside one object, but uh, the GPUs don't like that. This, so on GPUs, we just rearrange the memory to be a structure of array and things run faster. So um, we have, let's say, uh, a mechanism in Palabos which does this translation. So what we did during this 80 days project is we built an engine which generates the accelerated lattice from the multi-block -block lattice automatically. And so if you want to develop a new lattice Boltzmann model, what you need to do is provide Palabos with a policy class, which we have here on, on, on top. The policy class provides information to do the transition. For example, if your collision term relies on an extra force parameter, you need to say so. 
so that Palabos knows that there is more data which needs to, to be aligned properly, properly in memory to be made avail available to the GPU. But you are not going to, to you know, uh, touch the code of the accelerated lattice. You just provide uh, extra information for every new model to, in, in the shape of a policy class. So that's, that's, that's the big picture. But now the question is, how does the code perform? So we ran a benchmark on two computers. The first computer is a CPU machine. It's a high-end uh, desktop machine. Actually, both computers are desktop machines. So the first one is sitting right next to me. That's the Intel CPU with 48 cores. It is a desktop computer. It is quite fast. It is one of the best you can get. And the second computer is a GPU computer, which is one of um, uh, the, the best gaming GPUs which you uh, can get uh, those days. And all the, uh, all the benchmarks are executed in a single precision. And there is a full debate whether this is, it is better to run single or double precision. In Palabot, you can do both. On CPU or GPU, it's a template code, so we just compile it to single or double precision. But I mean, okay, there, there is going to be a discussion actually in the talk right after my talk. There is going to be a discussion of what is best and it's a matter of philosophy. But for now, I'm just presenting, you know, uh, uh, results uh, which are uh, single pre precision results. So the first uh, benchmark is a 3D Taylor Green vortex. So the image just shows a cut through uh, the domain. This is a really simple problem. It is homogeneous. It has no boundary conditions. And performance is uh, measured in mega laps. This is a million lattice uh, site updates per second. So more is better. And um, the CPU with all 48 cores reaches 180 megalabs. The GPU reaches 3,800 megalabs. And this is a speed up of 21. Now, we all know that GPUs like single precision. So the speed up is going to be smaller if you go to double precision, but it remains impressive. Okay, and this is a speed up which you get with the same code. Huh? You have the same Palabas code which runs 20 times, uh, 21 times faster without any effort on your side. The thing is, uh, so 3,790 uh, megalabs, is this a good or bad performance? On GPUs, we know that the performance for lattice Boltzmann applications is memory bound. So we have a theoretical maximum performance which you reach if you use all of the memory bandwidth. And if you compute that one, you get an optimal performance of 6,150 megalabs, which puts actually Palabos at 60% of the peak performance. It is, it is possible to do better than 60%, but not better because you cannot do better than 100%. You see, if I zoom into this picture, this 40% margin, which you have between Palabos and the maximum, you can push the performance a bit. If you use a simple code, which is not embedded in Palabos, if you use CUDA instead of parallel algorithms and so on. But you can maybe get 20% or so, okay? And this is not a lot. And the big message is nowadays, uh, we are really memory bound and whatever uh, model you use to implement uh, your, your, your GPU code, the performance is always going to be uh, somewhere between 60% and 80% of the peak. So it doesn't matter if you use uh, CUDA or OpenACC or, or whatnot. What is important in the end is that you choose your uh, programming approach to be convenient to have a nice software project. And this is what I propose today uh, and which, what we did with Palabos. And then the second example, and they have three examples to show, so we are um, uh, approaching the end. The example is a flow through a chorus. Two minutes. Is more complicated? Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing within one minute. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the second validation is a flow through a chorus media. This is more complicated because you have bounce back nodes, you have inflow, you have outflow. Here the CPU is doing a bit better because we also counted the bounce back nodes when we compute the megalabs. And the speed up is nine and a half. It is still impressive, okay? Again, a speed up which you get for free. The third example, which we also implemented on GPU, or which is actually the same code for CPU and GPU, but we have implemented the corresponding backend, is a 3D uh, Shangchen uh, multi component flow. And here you see things are more complex. You have to co couple the two species, species, and you, the code also adjusts the contact angle on, on boundaries uh, and, and everything. So the performance on GPU is divided by two because you have two populations, and then it is divided by two because you go through memory twice, once for collision streaming and once, once for the interaction force. This is why this time the CPU is doing a bit better, but still we have a speed up of six, 
which honestly is a nice speed up. And maybe if we really wanted to, I mean, the, the multi-phase code is just copy pasted from the old Palabas. Maybe we want to, one day we can also maybe try to optimize that one for, for GPU. But just out of the box, you have this six fold speed up. Okay, so this work is very much in its beginning. We are currently working on multi-GPU, which works but has performance issues. And next week, we join a GPU hackathon to resolve those issues. And we are also working on boundaries. And I reached the conclusion, <laughs> sorry. In conclusion, parallel algorithms is a modern formalism. It allows hardware agnostic implementation of GPU code. You write your code once, using nothing else than C++ and you run it everywhere. Although the programming approach is high level, you get state-of-the-art performance. And in my opinion, this is really an ideal framework to port an existing Lattice Boltzmann library to GPU, just as we did uh, with Palabas. Thank you for thank your time. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. There is a uh, uh, questions, yes. Uh, is the peak 104% performance estimated with the roof line model depending on the arithmetic intensity par par parameter? Um, the answer is no. So uh, if I understand right, uh, you wonder, so uh, as a side remark, oh, wait, I just, with Zoom, you always send a message to the last person and not to everyone. So let me send it again to everyone. Ah, so yes. Those are the links. <laughs> okay. So if I understand the question right, is uh, do we compare ourselves to the peak flop rate, which is advertised by the GPU? And the answer is no. I think with the Lattice Boltzmann code, you can never approach the peak flop rate because okay. the problem is memory bound. So for us, the peak performance is the peak in terms of memory access, in terms of memory bandwidth. Have you tried to use the more than one streaming uh, at uh, the same time to increase uh, the performance? Streaming uh, in turn put uh, two or more duties on the pipelines on the GPU. I am not sure if you are cool. Are you speaking about the, the Lattice Boltzmann streaming step? or no, 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 no. The, the CUDA one, the CUDA. yes. Well, I think that at this level of parallel algorithms, we cannot do that. We can okay. actually not address the streaming multiprocessors because we are at a higher level. Okay. And again, again, whatever we do, we can never get past the, the memory bandwidth limit. So if we could do that, I mean, with CUDA we did, okay? And as I said, if you use a simple CUDA code, you can get an extra 20%. But yes, it is okay. Not a big, it is not a big Yes, thing. thank you, thank you. Thank you again for the presentation. And so we can move to the next speaker. Uh, I give you the permission to share your screen. Okay, okay, yes, maybe you can do, do it. Yes. Okay. okay, good, good, it works. Perfect, okay. Uh, so the title of the presentation is on the impact uh, of the floating point uh, precision on accuracy and performance of Lattice Boltzmann method simulation. And the speaker is Mortiz Lehmann, please. So my name is Moritz Lehmann. I'm a PhD candidate at the SFB Microplastics at the University of Bayreuth. And after this 20 minute talk, um, you will be able to change maybe 15 lines of code in your existing GPU Lattice Boltzmann implementation, and then it will run twice as fast and only consume half as much memory. It sounds like magic, but it actually works with, with some caveats. I, I will go to them in detail. So in this talk, I will compare floating point position and how it affects the um, overall accuracy of Lattice Boltzmann simulations and also the performance. So um, for the Lattice Boltzmann method, what needs to be stored in, in memory? And um, for a standard single position floating point, FP32, um, you will need the velocity, three component vector, the density, and some sort of flex. And this is 17 bytes in total. However, you also need these density distribution functions. They're also called um, populations. And you need 
to store them twice um, for, for most implementations. So they make up most of the memory, um, 152 bytes in this case. But what if we store these um, density distribution functions in lower position, in, in only half position? So we still have the 17 bytes of the other stuff and then only 76 bytes for the DDFs. So overall, the memory footprint is reduced by 45%, almost cut in half. So this is the main motivation of, of the talk. However, um, the standard 16-bit um, floating point, it, it just will not work. It is too inaccurate. So a few things had to, had to come together to make it work. So the first thing is a paper from Scordus from 1993. And um, Scordus proposes to work with um, not the density distribution functions, but with the perturbations on them. So with shifted density distribution functions. Essentially, you um, subtract the lattice weights from the density distribution functions and then work with them. The second thing is the observation that um, when looking at what values do the, do the DDFs actually occupy, um, they are much smaller than two. So they only need a tiny number range. So for the IEEE floating point formats, which, which have a range up to 10 to the power of 30 or whatnot, all these, all these bit combinations are not used at all. Then I experimented with um, a custom floating point format. And I decouple the arithmetic position um, from the memory position. So um, do all of the arithmetic in FP32 and then do the storage um, of the DDFs in FP16, for example. And since no arithmetic is done in 16-bit floating point, any GPU and any CPU can run it. There's no limitations on the hardware. Compatibility is excellent. And even my mobile phone can run it, as I will um, show you later. So let's look at the Scordus um, optimization in detail. So um, on the left side, you have the naive um, Lattice Boltzmann implementation. Um, it consists of the streaming step where you just copy over the um, DDFs in memory. And the collision um, computes the density, the velocity, and then um, equilibrium um, DDFs. And then it um, merges them together with a collision operator, can be BGK, for example, and then it writes them from, to, to memory again. And Scordus does not change a lot of things. So um, for, the, for the density summation, you add one. And the um, equilibrium populations are computed slightly differently. And here it is essential um, to implement the um, equilibrium population equation exactly in this order of, uh, of operations. Because if you would change the order of arithmetic operations, you um, will encounter significant um, loss of position here. So it is really essential um, to go with the equation as it is um, presented here. Now, when looking at um, the numbers numerically in the naive implementation, um, we see that they um, always um, are close to um, the lattice, uh, close to the lattice weight. So for D3Q19, it is either um, 1 over 3, 1 over 18, or 1 over 36. So um, they are always close to these numbers. After the Scordus um, uh, optimization, they all cluster around 0. And um, this is really beneficial for floating point, because floating point numbers um, are most accurate um, around the 0 number. So the, um, the uh, the floating point representation is much improved um, with, with Scordus. And this is why already most um, implementations um, do this um, already, because um, the, the benefits are um, uh, apply across all position levels. Now a, a short introduction to floating point numbers. So um, this is how a floating point number is represented. So um, there's um, one factor for the sign. Um, one factor for the exponent, so the, uh, the S is the sign, the E is the exponent, you subtract a bias and um, you take two to the power of, of this term. And the second um, factor, uh, uh, the third factor is the um, mantissa and um, this dictates the accuracy that your floating point format will have. So the formats that we look um, in, in, at in this talk um, are um, the 64-bit, 32-bit and then three different 16-bit floating point formats. For the 16-bit floating point formats, so, so there's the, the IEEE format. This is the standard format um, 
And I also introduced two, two new formats. So the first one is identical to the IEEE format. Um, I just multiplied by two to the power of minus um, 15 before and after conversion. So I scaled down the exponent. Um, this has the same um, effect as um, modifying the exponent bias. The second format is entirely new. Um, you see that it only has four bits in the exponent and 11 bits in the mantissa compared to the five bits and the 10 bits for, for the IEEE format. If we look at their properties um, numerically, we see that the IEEE FP16 format, it has 3.3 digits of accuracy, which is much lower than 32-bit um, and um, even lower than 64-bit. The number range goes up to um, about 66,000. And we don't need um, these large numbers. We only need um, plus minus two, that's all. So the um, naive thing would be to just um, decrease the number range by pre-multiplying a factor. This is this FP16S format. And you see that now the number range is um, down to uh, plus minus two. And um, this enables us to resolve much tinier numbers down to 10 to the power of minus 12. However, the accuracy does not improve. You only get 3.3 uh, digits. Now with the entirely new um, custom format, the FP16C format, um, we have actually increased the number of digits by 0.3 digits to uh, 3.6 digits. And this has the same effect as um, cutting the truncation error in half. The um, number range is still limited to plus minus two. However, we cannot resolve as small numbers now, only um, down to 10 to the power of minus eight, but still better than the IEEE format by a factor of two. So um, the 16S and the 16C format um, differ. The um, 16S has more range towards tiny numbers and the 16C format has um, the trun truncation error cut in half. And the question is, which of these um, properties is um, more important for Lettuce Boltzmann? Um, now some more details on this custom format. Um, so the idea is to, to steal one bit from the exponent um, and increase the size of the mantissa. So this decreases the number range towards small numbers. Um, however, it increases um, the accuracy. We, um, we uh, choose the number range um, to plus minus two. So we uh, tune the um, exponent bias accordingly. And we get 3.6 digits, so 0.3 digits more half truncation error. So we have both superior accuracy and superior um, range towards small numbers compared to the IEEE format. However, conversion is difficult because for the, for the IEEE format, um, you can do the conversion in hardware. Any GPU, any CPU supports it in hardware. However, for our custom format, um, we need to emulate it in software. And this is really difficult. Um, I, I had to write the conversion algorithms myself. They're on screen. They're not particularly long, but they are um, full of um, bit manipulation and a lot of black magic, to be honest. So it's a lot of bit shifting, um, basically integer arithmetic. Overall, one conversion back and forth is 51 assembly instructions. So it's quite math intensive. It does correct rounding to nearest even, and it handles both normals and denormals, which is essential to, um, to cover tiny numbers. And um, yeah, the, the algorithm itself, it's only integer arithmetic, so any GPU and any CPU can handle it. Now the idea of um, decoupling arithmetic position and memory position. So this is the Lattice Boltzmann algorithm again. And now I highlight the part that we do um, with uh, arithmetic precision. So either FP64 or FP32, because any GPU um, can, can do this. So um, I mean, most GPUs are slow for FP64. I will come to this later. And for the memory precision, this is only um, this tiny part here. And um, the memory position we can do in lower position going even as low as FP16. And in between, um, there's floating point conversion, either um, done in hardware or um, emulated in software for our custom format. For the notation, um, uh, it, I, I call it FPXXYY. The XX, the first number, um, means the arithmetic position. The second number means the um, storage memory position. 
So now on to um, the lattice Boltzmann accuracy. So this is for soil flow through a um, 3D cylinder with the 3Q19. And um, on the X axis, I vary the um, cylinder radius. And on the Y axis, you see the A2 error. And as the um, channel radius increases, there's less staircase effect of the bounce back boundaries all around. So the error decreases and the error is um, exactly the same for FP64 and FP32, and even um, also mixed precision 64 and um, 32. However, the 16-bit um, formats, they struggle if the channel radius is too large. And the reason is um, that they, um, they struggle to resolve tiny differences in velocity. And if um, the channel is large from shell to shell, there's only a tiny difference in velocity. So they can't, um, they, they just can't resolve it from some point. However, you will see, um, you, you see that uh, the 16C format with the increased Matissa accuracy does noticeably better than the um, IEEE or also the um, 16S format. You might also have noticed the dashed, the, the dotted lines here in, in green and in blue. And um, this is corresponding simulations without the DDF shifting. So without the Scordus optimization. So you see that um, without DDF shifting, um, accuracy is completely insufficient. So this is really a, a necessary um, step to, to make it run. And the, um, the message here is that there's some, um, uh, some, some parameters um, for that 16-bit um, formats work and some parameters um, for which they don't work. And um, these are especially um, when, when there's uh, low velocity in the simulation. So as long as you don't have um, low velocity, you can use 16-bit formats. Now, another setup, this is the Taylor Green Ward. He says that we um, already saw in uh, Jonas Lutz's talk. Um, however, um, these are um, in, in 2D in this case. So you initialize the velocity field of the simulation um, to, to um, neighboring vortices. And then you just let it run and um, viscous friction will decrease the velocity. You then measure over time the um, total kinetic energy and the kinetic energy follows an exponential decay. And all of the simulations um, with all the precisions that we performed, they follow this analytic solution very well. However, at some point they can't resolve the tiny, uh, the tiny velocities anymore and they just um, remain at constant energy. Um, so this gives us insight um, to how small of a velocity can still be resolved. So 64-bit here obviously is the best one. And what is really remarkable is that um, the mixed precision 6432, it is almost as good as pure 64-bit. 32-bit is somewhere in the middle and the 16-bit formats um, handle it the worst. The dashed lines again represent simulations without the DDF shifting applied and here um, in, for, for the mixed um, 64, 32-bit, it is really terrible. It is as bad as the um, pure 32-bit without the optimization, and it's, it, is, it is really bad. And the 16-bit formats, they don't work at all without Scordus optimization here. So again, the message is that for, for tiny velocities, you need higher precision. But usually, um, such tiny velocities, you don't encounter them in the wild and real-world applications. And this is why um, very often you can still get by with 16-bit formats. So another setup, this is the oh, common um, vortex street. So um, uh, just a, a cylinder in 2D flow. And um, for, the, for the right Reynolds number, I think this is uh, Reynolds 250. It does um, this beautiful vortex street with regular vortices. This is after um, 100,000 uh, time steps. And 32-bit um, floating point and everything better, it, um, it just looks the same. However, for the 16-bit floating point formats, you notice in the low vorticity um, area, there is noise present. I also have to mention that the vorticity is um, very exaggerated, the range in this plot. So it's like a very overexposed image um, to, to see um, this uh, very subtle noise here. And yeah, the, the um, 16 and 16S formats, they do the same. So um, it means that uh, resolving tiniest numbers does not help here. The um, 16C format with increased Mantissa accuracy, it mostly mitigates this noise. So we know that um, the um, better Mantissa accuracy is more important. 
On the bottom, you see the same simulations, however, with, without DDF shifting, and you see um, that uh, there's a lot more noise present, so it's a lot worse here. When looking at it quantitatively, um, so here I, I took the center point of the simulation and I measured the x velocity over time. So does this um, regular oscillations, regular oscillations, it's not quite sinusoidal. Um, and it goes back and forth and back and forth about 50 times. And here in the plot, um, on the x axis, uh, the, the first part is in steps of 20,000. So 20, 40, 60, 80,000, then 98,000, 99,000, 100,000. So this last part is um, zoomed into the time scale to resolve the last um, um, oscillation here. And what is impressive is that um, you don't see the curves for the 64-bit um, and 32-bit at all because they are covered by the blue curve for the 16C format. So um, it, um, it resembles the, um, the quantitative shape of the oscillation very well, has no phase lag, and it's overall very accurate despite the noise in the low vorticity range. For the 16S format and the IEEE 16 format, there's a tiny bit of phase lag present. And without the scholars optimization, the phase lag is much more pronounced here. Now the lid driven cavity at Reynolds number 1000, also a, a standard test setup. And here it is impressive because all of them work and all of them are very accurate. If you zoom in by, uh, by, by, by a lot, then you will see that um, the 16S format deviates in the second digit of, of velocity and the 16C format um, deviates in the fourth digit. So they are very close to the ground truth so, uh, solution. Now a more complicated setup. So this is um, simulations with um, Lattice Boltzmann and the immersed boundary method with um, scalar strength forces. This is a micro capsule in, in shear flow. And as the flow goes um, to the right on the top and to the left on the bottom, the capsule is deformed here. And it does a sort of tank treading rotation. We now look at the deformation over time. So um, the, the long axis divided by the short axis, essentially this is this Taylor deformation parameter over time for different capillary numbers. So the, um, the micro capsule, it deforms and then it um, remains in a fixed deformation. So at some point the deformation doesn't go any further. And we see that all the simulations handle it very well. Only the 16S and um, IEEE 16 formats, um, they, they lag a bit behind here. So it's a bit um, more inaccurate. The 16C format is exactly on top of the other curves. So again, it doesn't matter if you use Q64 bit or 32 and 16C. However, without DDF shifting, the curves are here at the bottom. So the capsule doesn't deform at all. The simulations don't work. So DDF shifting, again, is essential here. Now for the final test, this is raindrop Please simulation. Go to the conclusion, thank you. Yeah, um, this is uh, um, raindrop simulations, um, uh, very, very large simulations. We don't see any difference here, neither visually nor quantitatively. If we look at the um, performance, we have very high performance, 80% speed up. We get 100% efficiency across the board with our 64-bit um, implementation. And the code runs on, on GPUs, it runs on CPUs, it even runs on, on the phone very efficiently. However, the gaming GPUs, they handle the 64-bit um, very poorly as expected. Now to conclude the talk and to compare all the formats, um, the 32-bit um, format, it is um, very accurate. Um, the um, memory footprint and, and performance, I've set them to 1x. The efficiency goes all the way up to 100% depending on the GPU. For 64, for 64 bit, the um, uh, accuracy is excellent. Again, the same as 32 bit in most cases. Memory footprint is twice as much. Peak performance is halved. However, on gaming GPUs, the efficiency is terrible. The mixed 64, 32 bit um, is uh, more similar to pure um, 32 bit. The memory footprint is all, uh, also um, very similar. However, performance is even more terrible than pure 64 bit because the uh, additional conversion overhead. And now the 16-bit mixed position formats um, without Scottish DDF shifting accuracy is um, insufficient. However, with DDF shifting accuracy is still good. Um, you have half the memory footprint, twice the performance and efficiency is still excellent, up to 100%. Um, the 16C format um, is even better than the 16S format. 
um, uh, precision, uh, the, the overall accuracy is like FP64. However, at low velocity, there's um, some, uh, some differences. Again, um, memory footprint half, performance twice as much. On FP64 capable GPUs, they enter the compute limit because of the conversion. So um, efficiency is not as great. However, on gaming GPUs, efficiency is excellent. So um, I hope that I um, could motivate you to go towards lower position for Lettuce Boltzmann it is not cheating. Um, and I have validated it, it is just as accurate as um, even 64-bit position. So um, there's uh, little downsides to going lower position. And yeah, you, you have half the memory footprint and um, get almost twice the performance, almost 16,000 mega lattice update, uh, updates for the 3Q19 on a single A100 GPU. And this concludes my talk and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It is uh, just a really short question because we are a bit late. I think that uh, at the beginning of your talk, you assume that DDFS remains small, but it is really the case for the multi-phase case, especially if the density is higher than 100. Um, I think I didn't understand it uh, correctly. Can you uh, rephrase it again? Uh, I think he is uh, referring to the beginning of your presentation. You assume that uh, DTFS remains small. But it is really this uh, the, the case uh, for a, a multi-phase when you have uh, a density higher of uh, 100. Ah, yeah, yeah. So um, this, case. this uh, is, um, I, I didn't test it with um, Shan Chen, for example. This uh, is for okay. mostly yeah. standard latest Boltzmann simulations and the density here is limited to, um, to up to six. So if you go any higher than the floating point numbers can't, um, can't resolve it anymore because it, it goes above the plus minus two. Um, but in, in the most cases you are close to one with the density and you always should be close to one because then accuracy is the best. And in most um, simulations are dimensionalized in a way that the density is always one. Yes. Even the, even the multi-phase simulations that I had with the raindrop, this is volume of fluid and all, also there the density is set to around one. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks again, we don't have time for other question. So I will move to the next speaker. The next uh, speaker is Mario Bedrunka from the University of uh, Siegen. That's right. Can you hear me? Session. Yes. Perfect. Uh, just uh, let me give you the permission to share your screen. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Okay. You are here. Okay. Okay. You are entitled to, to share your screen. So please uh, try if this is true. Perfect. Can you see the screen now? Yes, perfectly. Perfect. So, Good. hey, my name is Mario. I'm a PhD student from the University of Siegen, and I'm collaborating with the Hochschule Bonn Rhein Sieg and the Freie Universität Berlin. And today, today I am presenting our recently developed Lattice Boltzmann framework, Lattice, which is based on PyTorch, which is a machine learning uh, framework provided by developers from Facebook and comes to be therefore with machine learning functionalities that I'm going to present in the next minutes by introducing a neural collision model containing a neural network. So the presentation is structured as follows. First, I'm going to talk about our motivation, why we have developed a new CFD solver. Afterwards, I will introduce the framework's functionalities and then I present an idea of the usage of machine learning in the world of the Lattice Boltzmann method and its generalization of this proof of concept. And finally, I give an outlook on some hints um, or, and some hints on the current work and how to extend the neural collision model and other projects provided by our research group. So in the last years, it has become clear that deep learning can provide a benefit for classical simulation techniques. However, with a few exceptions, recent studies have not addressed possible connections between machine learning and the Lattice Boltzmann method. And the Lattice Boltzmann method itself, as you know, is an efficient simulation technique for computational fluid mechanics and beyond. And it is based on a simple stream and collide algorithm on Cartesian grids, which makes it easily compatible with machine learning architectures. 
And there are already modern lattice Boltzmann solvers available that are very efficient and popular, such as OpenLB, Viberla, or Palabos. But these are kind of complex, which limits not only rapid prototyping, but are somewhat difficult for beginners to get familiar with the lattice Boltzmann method. And this is why I developed Lattice, the PyTorch-based Lattice Boltzmann code written in Python with an according A. And PyTorch's API enables not only usage of efficient GPU and CPU operations, but allows us also to integrate machine learning capabilities into the Lattice Boltzmann method. So let me present you what functionalities are already included within Lattice. Lattice is able to perform two-dimensional and three-dimensional simulations on a standard workstation. And what I want to underline is that even complex 3D simulations can be run on, off a, uh, on an off-the-shelf GPU, like the recently uh, published 3000 models from NVIDIA. And yeah, Lattice is equipped also with a variety of frequently used collision models, such as the BGK model, the regularized model, and the KBC model. And for the latter, implementations are rare in open software packages. And many observables, such as energy and entropy, can be reported during the simulations. And in addition, a VTK reporter can be used for post analysis or animation purposes. So there are also several forcing schemes and boundary conditions available that can be easily applied. And based on PyTorch, Lattice comes with not only machine learning algorithms, but also with automatic differentiation which can be used, for example, for forcing schemes where gradients are required. And by default, Lattice comes with some flows such as a Taylor Green Vortex or a doubly periodic shear layer or a decaying turbulence case. However, a new set of flow can be easily implemented in Python using only NumPy operations, which are then transferred to tensor operations which are required by PyTorch. And as an example, our master student Martin Klimang has analyzed the influence of a roof angle of a house on the pressure gradient around the house, which he presented yesterday. And here are two examples of his work, which are simulated on both a local workstation and a cluster. Yeah, and I think I skipped this slide containing the explanation of the lattice Boltzmann method, since this audience is already familiar with the fundamental theory. However, I want to bring up and remind you on the degrees of freedom the Lattice Boltzmann method has based on the stencil used. And now let me introduce our first approach of a neural collision model based on neural networks. So the collision model constitutes the core of the Lattice Boltzmann method as it determines the solver's physics. And it, said it has long been known that the choice of collision model for a given partial differential equation is ambiguous which is related to the discrepancy between the number of degrees of freedom and in terms of discrete distribution function and macroscopic variables of interest. And for example, the standard D2Q9 stencil uses nine degrees of freedom per lattice node to encode six physically relevant moments, which are the density, the momentum, and the stress tensor. And the remaining degrees of freedom represented by higher order moments are usually propagated in such a way that offers certain numerical advantages such as improved stability or accuracy. And based on this, we defined a neural collision operator as a more accurate alternative to classical collision models. And for this purpose, a neural collision model is defined that relaxes the moments towards the equilibrium moments by individual relaxation rates, which are contained by the variable S on this slide. And for this purpose, a transformation matrix M transforms the distribution function F to moment space. And since the shear relaxation rates are related to the kinematic viscosity, they are determined due to the equations on the left table side for N0 to 5. And this recovers the Navier-Stokes equation in the weakly compressible regime. So the idea now is that the neural network provides the relaxation rate for the higher moments, which influence accuracy and stability. And the network determines the higher order relaxation rates based on all local moments as features or as inputs and is optimized to reproduce a final result to reference simulation. But more on this on the next slide. To avoid excessive over relaxation, an exponential function is applied on the output of the network. And this guaranteed that relaxation rate is larger than 0 0.5. And the flow chart shown on the slide summarizes the simple stream and collide algorithm and the neural collision architecture. So the features as input are given by all transferred moments based on the distribution function, which lead to the output of a neural network that comes or that provides the relaxation rate for the higher moments. 
And the relaxed moments toward the equilibrium are then transformed back to distribution space or the, the distribution function. So like every human being working on a specific task, each network requires training, a data set, and a feedback for optimizing itself. And training data was generated by simulating a doubly priority shear layer using the BGK model. The training procedure optimizes the network's parameters to minimize the discrepancy between a low resolved and a high resolved simulation. And therefore the discrete distribution from, uh, from the training trajectory are mapped onto a causal grid with half of the reference grid points. And batches of short simulations with a neural collision model are started from each snapshot. And after a defined number of steps, the flow field are compared with a final reference simulation based on energy, velocity, and vorticity. And the mean squared deviations of these quantities from the reference are minimized using the atom optimizer and the loss function. So for this purpose, a relatively shallow network with one hidden layer and 530 parameters is introduced to keep the computational cost feasible. And the simulation steps after the loss function is applied are 100 steps and we use a grid resolution of 128 times 128 for the high resolved simulation to train the neural collision model on a grid size of 64 times 64. And here are the results after training was done. In the first row, the reference and training data are shown using the BGK model on a grid size of 128. In the second row, the results of our neural collision model are illustrated on a grid size of 64. And in the third row, the BGK model on a grid size of 64 is shown. And last but not least, on the last row, um, the regularized model. So the vorticity fields shown in the figure clearly show that the simulation used with the BGK operator can no longer capture the vortices from the final reference simulation. But in contrast, the neural collision model accurately reproduces these structures. So the, vort yeah, the vorticity over the diagonal lines demonstrates also that the neural collision model is less dissipated than the regularized model. So the crucial question now is, whether the optimized network is transferable to other flows. And the figure shows the energy evolution and the energy spectrum for an isotropic decaying turbulence simulation at a Reynolds number of 30,000. And although trained on a different flow, the neural collision model reproduced the vortex field far better, while other collision models were either unstable or overly dissipated, as shown in the vorticity fields. So the BGK model was not able to handle the high Reynolds numbers, and introduce unphysical small scale oscillations. These numerical artifacts are visible in the energy spectrum, revealing a lot of unphysical energy accumulated at high wave numbers. And by contrast, the regularized collision model is more dissipative at larger wave numbers, resulting in a much faster energy and enthalpy decay. And in comparison to these baseline models, the machine learning enhanced simulation produced a best match with a reference simulation. And this example demonstrates general, generalization capabilities and the potential benefit of using collision models based on neural networks. So what are the next steps? First, we want to expand the neural collision model to three dimension and analyze the behavior of this operator in more detail. Here we have to deal with memory issues because you, if you all know, the lattice Boltzmann method is everything but not memory friendly. And here comes a custom backward propagation is for this case required. Um, because every time during training, you apply a, the neural collision model, model or the network, a lot of data is stored in the memory. And when you train your model on one GPU, you are limited to 16 gigabytes of memory, which is not a lot. And with a custom backward procedure, you can make this efficient. So we have to handle this issue. And furthermore, at the moment, we are working on a multi-GPU usage too. And this enables not only faster simulations, but also more memory usage for larger flows. And in terms of efficiency, we are implementing a custom CUDA extension as well for the lattice Boltzmann algorithm to increase the performance significantly. So thank you very much for joining my presentation. I hope you were interested in this topic and I'm looking forward to answer some of your questions or all. And furthermore, you're welcome to play with the code since the framework is open source available at GitHub and you can access the repository via link or GitHub or the QR code. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We have uh, two questions. 
up to now. Okay, the first is uh, how you define your cost fun function. Is it a difference from the reference training da data? Uh, first. Uh, excuse me. The definition yeah. of uh, your cost fu function. Yeah, so the cost function is the mean squared error from the velocity, the energy, and the vorticity. Mm -hmm. And you sum up all the um, scalars of your global field and make the mean squared error and makes the difference between your output after 100 steps provided by your neural collision model and the final reference simulation from the BGK operator. Uh, the second question is also if did you check uh, your neural if your neural network is overfitted um what do you mean with overfitted probably you have by no... um or by taking uh not only the training data into evaluation but also um i can intend this uh, exactly i yeah, so, I, I can um, think if your uh, window is too is too narrow of uh, yeah of okay i know what cases. you're talking about so um first we transferred to another flow um, which produce quite good uh, results for our case and since this is only a proof of concept we are going to analyze this in more detail in the next months but um, not yet okay there is alexander wagner which is asking uh, if you can repeat a bit the, the, the definition of the neural collision operator. If I have yes. that you are fitting the relaxation times. So maybe this. So the neural collision operator is defined here in okay. this equation. Yes. And so first we transform our distribution function to moment space via okay. a transformation matrix. Mm -hmm. And um, in the variable S, we have our relaxation rates mm -hmm. for yes. our physical moments. Yeah. In the case of a DTQ9 stencil, we have six physical moments provided by this equation. And our neural network provides the relaxation rates to the tau. Mm -hmm. And this output, we on this output, we apply an exponential function to achieve positive um, yes. relaxation rates. And then we add also a 0 0.5 to okay. um, yeah, yeah, make yeah. it more stable. <laughs> yes, yes. Thanks. And the other question, could you please specify the relaxation parameters which were used by the neural collision in the end? This is a really technical question. I don't know if you have exactly. Uh, could you please specify the I don't know if um, absolute the numbers. Values or what do you mean, Stefan? I don't know. Let me see. If... Yes. Um, I don't have an at the moment, but I can look on them and can give you them. Okay. Yes. Uh, there is another question. Can you comment on the spectral dispersion dissipation of the optimized collision model as a function of the signal wave number? Can you comment on this? um what do you mean exactly with this question or can we rephrase it the problem is that i think uh, the spectral uh, the, spe the spectrum of the, the dispersion uh, and this and dissipation that you have uh, you have showed in uh, um, presentation when do you mean the energy uh, Pascal yes. on the in the energy probably spectrum yes yes i think yes i'm not sure um, but... not yet but i can um, implement uh yeah an additional graph and provide it to you Sayed. okay okay i think uh, 
uh, there are several que questions. Yeah, maybe, maybe I you can, answer, can them answer them all in the chat. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> directly in the in chat, the so we can leave uh, all the people to enjoy the coffee <laughs> break. Okay. Okay, so see, see you later at the Bye. 4 and 20 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for listening. Oh, Mary, if you have a coffee break right now, would you mind sticking around? They can ask you some questions directly. Yes, 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 yes of yes. course. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you need a coffee right now. No, uh, I can wait 40 minutes. <laughs> Good. Uh, this is very I interesting. Love you. We've been thinking about, about things like that as well. Um, and so, so what you're doing right now is you're fitting just the relaxation times, right? Right. And the relaxation times essentially become a function of some kind of All local, local density, moments, velocity, um, and what other things go in there? No, um, the energy and the velocity and the vorticity are only used during training to optimize the network. But the features are all local moments. Um, so in the DTUQ9 stencil, we have nine inputs at each local node to provide the relaxation rate at this node. So could you actually find out, I mean, you didn't plot this out, but in principle now you have the information of what the relaxation time should be as a function of those local moments, right? Right. So in, you would be able from this to kind of actually extract a, a new de deterministic, I know it doesn't go in the spirit of what you're doing, but you could in principle extract a de deterministic model where you can say, well, if I choose my relaxation times tall to be a function of these input parameters, as learned by the, by, by the neural network, then I get the neural network performance, right? Yes, right. The question is if uh, the network trains um, in, in perfect relaxation time for the global field, which is not only, or which is not variable in terms of a refer, with respect to the input, mm -hmm. or if the output is really changeable in with respect to the input. So uh, our first approach, um, or the first proof of concept shows that the relaxation times only changes in the third or fourth digit after the decimal point. Mm -hmm. And now we have to think about the trading by with different Reynolds numbers and maybe different flows. So the mm -hmm. reason why we sh choose a doubly periodic shear layer was that we have the um, yeah, homogeneous fields and also the large gradient between the both, uh, yeah, both streaming fields. Mm -hmm. And our idea was that the neural collision operator learns that, uh, that he has to add more dissipation, for example, at two of these gradients. Mm -hmm. It's now I mean, what you're doing, I mean, that makes perfect sense, right? So you need to have a limited amount of stuff that you can fit, right? Uh, so just picking the relaxation times is it's a nice way of doing that and it obviously it works well but in principle of course there's nothing that tells you that the equilibrium distribution for instance is you should be using this particular uh, uh, quadratic expansion in, in velocities right there is well i mean even in in the known literature there is these entropic equilibrium distributions and other ones that you can also use right uh, yeah, so but the equilibrium distribution of equilibrium uh, function stays the same. Exactly, but it wouldn't have to, right? So in principle, if you've had just as input the resulting flow field that you want, you could yes. actually optimize that as well and see whether there might be better equilibrium distributions in principle, right? Yeah, indeed. But uh, when you add the equilibrium distribution function to your system, you make a great check on physical reasons. So. One mm -hmm. crucial element by using neural network is how to um, yeah, how to uh, pro nicht provide um, beibehalten. How do you check? You can German. You can talk Deutsch, but it's okay. Okay, uh, beibehalten <laughs> in English. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, wie man die Physik halt immer noch beibehält. Mhm. Man im Prinzip braucht man ja nur die Symmetrie, äh, die Erhaltungssätze und Es gibt ja diese, zum Beispiel die Entropic uh, Equilibrium Distributions. Die sind natürlich immer. Okay. Yes, we can see. Okay, you can see my screen. Okay, yes. I'm going to start. 
so uh, my name is Anastasia Perepelkina. I am from uh, Keldish Institute of Applied Mathematics in Russian Academy of Science in Moscow. Uh, our institute has a uh, rich history in developing uh, computational fluid dynamics schemes in Soviet Union. And our research group has debuted in the last DSFD conference with um, uh, extension to a particles of demand scheme. However, this is not a main area of expertise of our research group specifically. Uh, the thing that we are uh, doing uh, best is uh, developing efficient parallel algorithms for uh, implementation of numerical simulation in physics. And in this talk, I would like to introduce uh, the CFD community to our work and our recent results. Uh, so I'm going to introduce, uh, so these are some uh, performance records uh, that um, we have obtained in comparison to some of the records of some other groups. So here, uh, first two uh, publications is not ours. The first one is the best one that we have found in a published literature, however, it is a bit old. Uh, the second one is I have um, edit just now after listening to a very interesting talk uh, in this uh, session. Please correct me if I have uh, written these results wrong, but I have listened it in the talk just before. And here are uh, the, below are the results in performance that we have obtained and published in the recent years. So we have uh, obtained a quite high performance. And in this presentation, I will explain the techniques that we are using and how we are going to use all of this to make a unified approach to heterogeneous code in, for Lattice Boltzmann. Uh, for this, let's start with a situation that we are uh, in now, it is a, a trend in a machine balance of the recently uh, developed computer systems. Here we see that uh, both in computing performance and in memory throughput, the computers, both uh, graphical processors and CPUs are becoming better and better. However, there is a trend that machine balance, the ratio for, of memory throughput to computing performance is actually becoming worse. So this is the problems for the programmers who are trying to make codes for computer simulation. And uh, from this um, uh, graph, we can see that the estimate of the performance of uh, CPU and GPUs is about uh, the uh, digits that we have uh, included in this table. And uh, the bandwidth, it's also here. We see that GPU are better both in performance and uh, memory bandwidth. Uh, we are targeting this kind of uh, heavy node that is uh, specified on the uh, top of the slide. And we also note that the um, architecture and programming model for parallelism and for data storage in CPU and GPU are very different. But to use them uh, uh, together, we need to make a unified approach to this. Uh, in this talk, we are targeting the simple LBGK model. Uh, it is a good test bed for algorithm development and also uh, specifically this uh, variation is easy to compare to other high performance code. So we are be referring to this scheme. Uh, we estimate uh, the number of um, operations for BGK collision as 360 floating point operations per cell update. And we uh, estimate uh, the data storage for uh, particle distribution functions as 80 bytes per cell for CU19 model. Uh, uh, looking at these values and on the values on the previous slide, we see that the peak performance, if it is um, limited with a peak computing performance, would be these digits. And if we estimate the load and store per each um, distribution function value per cell, and if it's limited with the memory throughput, it will be have these limits. The limits of memory bandwidth is uh, 
visibly uh, much more strict. And uh, these limits are actually uh, like ideal limits. Like if uh, there is no overhead and uh, the code is uh, implemented 100% efficiently, and uh, uh, if there is uh, only one store and one load per P PDF value per cell update, which is uh, not usually uh, obtained. So let us start by obtaining uh, this limit of memory throughput for this uh, memory bound problem of Lattice Boltzmann. Uh, here we look at the elementary cell update. The goal to obtain the limit specified on the previous slide would be one load operation and one store operation per particle distribution function value by cell update. Uh, the, uh, the research in this topic has started more than 15 years ago. Uh, the first thing that the authors uh, developed, uh, many authors developed it simultaneously, is to fuse streaming and collision operations into one cell update. Uh, this results in uh, streaming schemes that are commonly called pull or push. In pools, in each cell, we collect the values from the neighboring cells and uh, perform the collision in the central cell. In the push, it is in the contrary. Uh, however, here we need to store two copies of data arrays to uh, avoid uh, data collisions. Uh, it, uh, it, it is not good if the memory layout is uh, limited, like uh, the GPUs have uh, not much memory. The next uh, thing that was developed is an AA pattern in which the, uh, um, there is an in-place modify property like for each cell. Uh, the data is loaded and stored to the same places. Only one copy of the array is required and the uh, limit of one uh, uh, store and load operations can be uh, obtained. Uh, and the next uh, uh, development is a, as a twist uh, streaming scheme. It has even better locality than the AA pattern. And the scheme that we have developed, uh, we call a uh, compact streaming pattern. Uh, in it, we uh, uh, provide even more locality than uh, esoteric twist streaming pattern by combining the cells into groups of uh, two um, cells in each axis. It is uh, uh, very similar to the Margolis neighborhood um, uh, to, uh, uh, cellular automaton. Uh, it has uh, it, it works on a mirrored um, uh, a coordinate axis inside the group, and uh, its uh, main property is that for the uh, um, complete update of a group of uh, eight cells in three D, only the data of these eight cells is uh, read and it is saved. So with this compact streaming scheme, we obtain the limit of one goal and uh, uh, of one load and one store operation per cell automatically. So in, uh, in any uh, loop traversal, in any uh, implementation of uh, the loops over the domain, uh, the goal of uh, uh, ideal uh, load and store balance will be obtained. And even comparing with esoteric twist pattern, which is called esoteric between, because it is quite complex to understand for a human uh, programmer, uh, it, uh, the compass streaming was quite uh, complex when it was uh, found. However, uh, with an interesting uh, enumeration of uh, particle distribution function values inside the group, we have uh, led to, uh, we have come to a very simple uh, code that the streaming operations for all 27 uh, values in the most uh, dense uh, lattice Boltzmann variation is uh, implemented just by this uh, uh, code and nothing else. It is a real uh, uh, snippet from the code that is working. So we are going to uh, reach the peak that was. Um, estimated from the memory bandwidth. But we are uh, what we're actually doing with uh, our uh, development of the algorithms is um, we need to overcome it. 
So if we are limited by uh, memory bandwidth, uh, uh, oh, here, here, um, I will think I need to introduce the Ruflin model here. Um, the Ruflin model is introduced for um, uh, computer code optimizations, and it uh, arranges the problems for, for compute-bound problems and memory-bound problems dependent on the operational density parameter. How much operations are required by the algorithm per load of store? So if we have many operations, <clears throat> our code will be limited by peak performance, and if we have more load and stores, it will be limited by the memory throughput. And if we, our data fits the RAA memory, it will be limited with uh, this roof line. But there is a system of computer caches in uh, CPUs and uh, just a bit uh, and other uh, hierarchy for GPUs. And if we localize our tasks in the high levels of computer hierarchy, we will be limited not by uh, this throughput, but by a higher throughput. So we need to overcome this roof line and to be, find a better peak, we need to uh, find an algorithm that can localize the, the processing in a higher levels of computer hierarchy. Uh, here is a roof line for GPU, and um, uh, usually the uh, problems that are computed in GPUs are limited by uh, this pink uh, uh, roof line. And um, if the data of uh, the simulation does not fit uh, 32 gigabytes, it uh, will be hosted in a CPU memory. However, it's uh, Bedwins is even lower. So this uh, is a problem, is a usual problem to uh, use a computer storage for GPU simulations because the exchange rate with the CPU will limit the performance so that uh, uh, the acceleration with uh, GPUs will be not relevant. So uh, here is uh, how we can overcome the roof line. Uh, there are two ways. First is to increase the arithmetic intensity, and second is to go to another roof line, to the higher roof line. It can be implemented if we take the dependency graph as a, of a problem as a complete task and decompose it into subtasks that span several time layers. Uh, these approaches are quite um, uh, sparse in the publications. The terminology is not consistent, but the terminology that we found most in the latest Boltzmann code is called temporal blocking. Here are some authors that have used uh, these uh, methods apart from our group. Uh, so let me explain. If we take a portion of the data that feeds the high memory level, and we pro process as much operations as we can with the data that we have, we don't need to perform uh, any load and stores when we are processing it. However, this will span several time layers and the common time space loops cannot be used. We need to decompose the task of updating the whole domain into these uh, interesting shapes in four dimensional space and time. Uh, the common use, uh, temporal blocking is uh, decomposition into pyramids, trapezoids, and uh, diamonds and tetrahedra, which leads to a variety of complex shapes. Uh, so we uh, uh, prefer to shift to this kind of subdivision that is uh, showed uh, in the bottom. Uh, it's, it is quite the same, uh, so we uh, can load to the high memory levels some base and process in this way front fashion and on each time step we need to load and save only a small amount of data. It is good for localization in the high memory levels and it is also good for parallelism. So uh, in this uh, uh, picture here we are showing that if we, for two parallel processors uh, uh, synchronization is usually required at each time step. But if we decompose the task into diamonds and uh, pyramids, the synchronization events are less frequent. 
So I'm going uh, to show you the variety of uh, such algorithms that we have developed in our group over the years. And I will be showing them as uh, colorful pictures of polygons. And for you to understand what these polygons means, here is this slide. So we uh, the polygon, the shape that I'm going to show you, uh, it depicts or some algorithm. The algorithm consists in the processing of the dependency graph nodes that are inside of it. And an algorithm goes with this rule of subdivision. Like if uh, the processing of some number of nodes is a task, the decomposition of algorithm into subshapes is subtasks. There are dependencies between these tasks and uh, the common uh, time space loops that are used uh, by um, many uh, implementations uh, depict the algorithms as uh, flat layers in time. So here uh, on the left is the common traditional loops and uh, on the right is a variation of temporal blocking. Uh, we can use this uh, algorithm construction method for both storage hierarchy on GPU and CPU. We can use it to, to find a synchrony on all levels of parallelism. We can shift uh, uh, to higher operational intensity and make the problems compute bound. And it works because uh, Lattice Boltzmann, like many numerical scheme stencils, has local dependencies. Uh, here is uh, one algorithm that we have implemented for Lattice Boltzmann on CPU, Confold algorithm. Here is the simulation domain uh, depicted in uh, this cube. We cover it with this uh, slanted prisms. These slanted prisms have a rule of subdivision. If the subdivided subtask falls outside the domain, we uh, treat it as an empty task that has nothing to do. And we uh, subdivide uh, uh, the tasks only inside, uh, find the dependencies between them and implement them in a parallel code. Uh, it is uh, uh, easy to use a uh, modern Z, Z curve data structure for such kind of algorithms. Uh, oh, minutes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, these uh, algorithms can be uh, found in parallel. So you can see the green. Uh, uh, prisms here, slanted prisms here are completely asynchronous. And for the large number of steps that can be processed absolutely asynchronously without any data synchronizations. Uh, we find the uh, connection between parallel uh, prisms and uh, pyramids uh, by uh, combining the different kind of shapes. And uh, on the roofline model, it works so that um, if we have a larger algorithm, it may fit uh, uh, CPU RAM and limited by a high level uh, of uh, roofline. Uh, and because it has high operational intensity having many operations inside. It is decomposed into subtasks, which have lower operational intensity. They are to the left side of the roof line. But if this whole subtask can fit a high level of cache, it will be limited by another roof line. So we plot this limit from right to left, where each arrow the, corresponds to some decomposition level, and find the actual limit of uh, of one cell uh, elementary cell update, the red line here. The red cross is our actual performance re result. And the ideal stepwise that uh, is a limit for all um, programmers that use traditional loops is plotted in um, a black line here. This is the roof line for CPU and the common terminology, uh, uh, I mean, um, the similar terminology and algorithm construction methods can be used on GPU, which uses uh, similar shapes. So um, the base of such prism is uh, distributed cells that are distributed between CUDA threads. And uh, when uh, this uh, base of threads is processed by a CUDA block, it uh, uh, saves only this small layer of shapes, which we found a useful word in the dictionary, which is called uh, nomen. And, and it needs to load from the memory only this uh, narrow layer of cells. So the data exchange uh, with a global memory of uh, RAM uh, of um, GPU memory uh, uh, is uh, 
uh, less frequent and all the data that is in the GPU base is localized in the highest level of um, uh, GPU hierarchy, the registers. Here is a um, roof line that we have for uh, high-end GPU uh, the, that can be uh, used in the desktop computers. Here is the result that we have obtained uh, with our algorithms, which is higher than a 100% peak for the traditional loops over the domains. Uh, here is a... Uh, um, uh, I, I don't think I have time the, for here. Yes. No. <laughs> if you can uh, achieve the conclusion. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, conclusion here is that we use uh, the same technique to store the memory uh, of the simulation on the CPU and process into GPU without the loss of performance uh, because we store only um, small uh, areas of the domain of the GPU. And uh, here we uh, is uh, some illustrations how we uh, combined the bo both algorithms in GPU and CPU for many years, for multi GPU and CPU computation. And uh, in conclusion, uh, just um, in total, what I wanted to deliver in this talk is that we have an algorithm construction method that allows us to break the roof line ceilings, the memory bound ceilings for the stencil problems, and to use all available resources of modern computers for the efficient codes. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I don't know if there are questions. I have a curiosity. I don't know if uh, you have uh, already said, but uh, there, these uh, uh, these uh, codes are uh, open source, are uh, available uh, or not? Uh, we are sorry, we are, do not publish them open source, but if okay. you ask uh, anyone in our group, we can provide uh, Okay, no, uh, it's just a curiosity. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for the nice, presentation, we can move uh, to the next uh, speaker. The next uh, speaker is uh, Gautier Wissot. I don't know if yes. my pronunciation is yes, correct. correct. Yes, correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Can you, you hear me, yes? Yes, I so give you the permission it. to share your screen. Check if uh, you got the right. Uh, yes, I think. Okay. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. Yeah, just thank you. To Put it. Uh, so please, uh, yes, and, uh, proceed. Thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Gauthier Isok. I'm a postdoc currently working at M2P2, which is a lab that is uh, affiliated with uh, Ex Marseille University. And today I'd like to introduce you quite a theoretical subject regarding the hydrodynamic limits and the numerical errors of some isothermal lattice Boltzmann schemes. So first of all, let me introduce you a brief of context of the, the present work, which regards uh, basically the dissipation and stability properties of uh, several lattice Boltzmann collision models. So uh, in order to introduce it here, uh, here I, um, I show you a very common test case, which is a case of vortex convection inside the periodic box with a Dittrichian lattice at a Mach number equals 0 0.3, so it's quite a moderate Mach number, and with several athermal lattice Boltzmann collision models. So here I use three models, which is the very common BGK model, uh, the projected regularization by Jonas Latt and Chopard, and the uh, recursive regularization, which is also an advanced collision model uh, by Orestis Malaspinas. So first, let me show you what we obtain if we try to use the very common BGK collision model with this case. And we can see that uh, it is very low dissipative, but very unstable. We can because we can see that after uh, before one period inside the periodic box, we can see that the computation crashes, which is actually quite well understood today because uh, this phenomenon is attrib attributed to the, the presence of non hydrodynamic modes inside the simulation. So we have uh, some spurious modes that are unstable inside this simulation. So in order to try to improve uh, the collision model, we can uh, switch to a regularization, which intends to filter out some of these non-hydrodynamic modes. And we can see that with the projected regularization, uh, the scheme is even more unstable in this test, test case. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, if we use the recursive regularization, 
we can see that this time uh, the vortex uh, computation is stable and uh, it achieves several passages inside the, the periodic box. So here, what is very surprising is that with the projected regularization, we have a scheme that is more unstable than the BGK model on this particular test case. And actually, uh, these phenomena, these properties have been exhibited in a previous work thanks to uh, some linear stability analysis of the, the model. So here I show you the main results we obtain with the projected regularization. And I plot what we call a, a dissipation curve. So here I will present actually the amplification rates of some linear modes that we inject inside the, the code uh, as function of the dimensionless wave number of the corresponding fluctuations. And here I plot in, a, in dashed line in dashed line, sorry, the Navier-Stokes theory, so what we want to have, the physical dissipation, and in solid line, I plot what we obtain with the DGK9 lattice with the projected regularization. And we can see that there is one mode here, which has a positive amplification rate for any wave number, which means, which is at the origin of the instability. So here we can recover the instability of the model, which is at the origin of the instability of the vortex, of the convected vortex, Test case. So these observations raised uh, two questions actually, which are uh, first, how can we explain this unexpected behavior of the regularization? And then is it possible to correct it in order to improve uh, our model? So in order to try to uh, understand these issues, I'd like here to come back to the main basics of the LBM and how can we build it from the kinetic theory? So I think most of you know that we can relate the lattice Boltzmann method to the Boltzmann equation, which actually represents uh, a fluid at the kinetic scale. And we can show that if we perform a particular asymptotic expansion, uh, especially in Knudsen numbers, so such as the chapman hensler expansion, we can show that the Boltzmann equation tends toward the Euler and Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, so they are its hydrodynamic limits at the macroscopic scale. And then if we want to build a lattice Boltzmann method, <clears throat> we have to discretize the Boltzmann equation in terms of velocity. So we have to do it on a lattice and you obtain what we call the discrete velocity Boltzmann equation, which I will refer to as the DVBE in my presentation. And we can show that if we perform a chapman hensler expansion on this equation in order to have the hydrodynamic limits of this model, we can show that it tends toward the isothermal Euler and Navier-Stokes equation. So it's isothermal because this lattice, the, the t 2 lattice, for example, uh, does not allow for the, the consideration of temperature fluctuations. So then in this context, the lattice Boltzmann method can be seen as nothing but a particular numerical scheme to solve the DVBE. So it's only a single uh, discretization in time of, and space of the DVBE. And what is very interesting to notice is that the DVBE is linearly stable. Its linear stability is ensured. So that uh, we have very good reason to think, think that uh, the numerical errors performed during the time and space discretization of the LBM are at the origin of all the issues that we, we observe. And this is interesting because uh, we can uh, a priori investigate these kind of issues using classical tar expansions in, in, uh, in time step and mesh size, which is what people usually do for decades in the, the analysis of Navier-Stokes schemes. But here uh, in the lattice version method, it is a bit more difficult than that because here uh, two problems actually arise. So the first one is that if we perform a Taylor expansion in time, uh, in time step and mesh size of this equation, we, uh, it will not lead to a closed macroscopic system because we would remain at the kinetic scale and we will not be able to interpret the errors at the macroscopic scale. We will need another expansion. And the second issue is that uh, if we try to focus on the limits delta t tends towards zero, it implicitly assumes that delta t is much lower than every uh, physical time in our computation, and especially and particularly uh, the relaxation time tau of the collision model. But in practice, the time step is uh, very, uh, very often uh, more uh, more large, uh, much larger, sorry, much larger than the relaxation time of the collision model. So that's even if we could do such a Taylor expansion, it will not provide us any uh, practical 
in uh, practical conclusion on what we uh, observed uh, in our simulations. So in order to address uh, these two issues, uh, we propose here another kind of new method methodology, another kind of Taylor expansion, which is, so instead of performing a Taylor expansion in time and space, we perform a Taylor expansion in the Knudsen number so as to uh, try to find out the hydrodynamic limits of the lattice Boltzmann method in the discrete set setting. So we remain in the discrete setting. And then by comparing our equivalent partial differential equations with our targets, which are the isothermal Euler and Navier-Stokes equations, we can uh, see explicitly the consistency of our model with these equations and the numerical errors so that, so that we can focus on the, the stability uh, and the equations. So this methodology has been uh, submitted uh, to a journal of Com computational physics this year. And it is also av available on archive. So I invite you to, to look at this uh, reference if you are interested in, the, in this topic. And here my presentation, I will only uh, show you the brief uh, steps, the, the big steps of the methodology and the main results we obtain with several collision models. So here, let me show you the, the example of the very common BGK collision model. So here I will write the very common, very simple scheme, so the collide and stream scheme for an isothermal fluid and in the particular case of an acoustic scaling between the mesh size and the, the time step. So the first time of the methodology is to perform a non-dimensionalization of this scheme in order to make two dimensionless numbers appear. So the first one is a Knudsen number, which is a physical number. And the second one is arbitrarily uh, chosen as delta t divided by tau, the relaxation time of the collision model, which is a purely numerical number. So here I have to insist that uh, the, the distinction between a physical number and a numerical number is very important between, because it will allow us to make a systematic difference between the consistency errors, which are related to the physical number and the numerical errors, which are related to this numerical number. And then uh, we basically perform a Taylor expansion of uh, this scheme uh, in Knudsen number, so as to obtain a system of partial differential equation. And then we compute the moments of the system, uh, which is basically uh, in the computation very close to what we do when we do a Chapman and expansion, even if it's not uh, strictly speaking a Chapman and expansion. And here is what we obtain for the particular example of the G1Q3 lattice. So here we present the mass and momentum equation we recover. And we can see that we recover the Navier-Stokes equation where we have the, the viscous flux here, which is at the first order in Knudsen number. So it's in the agree agreement with the Chapman and Stokes expansion. And then we recover some kinds of errors, some kinds of deviations, deviations at several orders in Knudsen number. So we can show that the first order uh, deviation are actually viscosity errors. The second order, uh, um, second order errors are dispersion error. And the third order one is a hyperviscosity error, which is actually uh, a viscosity of higher order. This is uh, actually a, a fourth order viscosity. And then we can take a look uh, more deeply in the shape of these different error terms. So for example, here viscosity dispersion and hyperviscosity error. And where on the left, I represent the error on the mass equation and on the right, the error on affecting the momentum equation. And here I plot in blue, the consistency errors and in red, the numerical errors, which are actually directly related to uh, the numerical parameter delta t over two, which means that if delta t tends towards zero, these numerical errors tend towards zero, and we only keep the consistency error of our scheme. And we can see, for example, if we focus at the, at the viscosity error, we can see that there is no error affecting the mass equation, but there is one error affecting the momentum equation, which is a consistency error, which is uh, actually the very common uh, Mach error, also referred to as the Galilean invariance due to the low number of velocities in our lattice. So then regarding the, the main results we obtain with several collision models, here I show you the results in the comparison between the BGK model and the standard regularization. So for example, the PR, the projected and the re recursive regularization. Um, both models actually have the same viscosity error, which is still the common Mach uh, or Galilean invariance error. 
So in order to understand the main difference between these models in terms of dissipation, we have to go further in the, in the expansion and focus on the numerical hyperviscosity. And if we look at here, the example of the D2 cunein lattice, so here I will present for the BGK and for the PR model, the global shape of the error, uh, the hyperviscosity error affect, affecting the Y momentum equation. And we can see that for the BGK model, we have a consistency error plus a second order, second order error term in delta T. And for the regularization, we have more terms. So we have uh, still a consistency, but several error terms at different powers in delta T. And here I have to recall that uh, in practice, we usually have the, the ratio delta T over two, which is much larger than one. So that in the particular case of the regularization, these terms uh, actually takes the, the upper hand uh, in, the, in, the, in all the other terms. So this term is the, is the biggest one. And uh, we can uh, focus on this term and perform a linear stability analysis of only this term. And we can show that this term is actually uh, responsible for the instability we observed in the linear stability analysis of the projected regularization. So this term is exactly responsible for the instability of the model and so uh, the instability of uh, the convective uh, vortex this case. So this phenomenon has been referred to in the, in the paper as uh, degenerating hyperviscosity because it is a numerical hyperviscosity that is not expected uh, at the Navier-Stokes scales, but that degenerates because of very large uh, prefactor, uh, which is here a numerical prefactor. So uh, then by comparison, we can see that the BGK cohesion model is not subject to such a degeneracy, which is actually attributed to a particular relationship that occurs in the error terms of uh, the Taylor expansion. So that the low dissipation of the BGK collision model can be explained by uh, such an analysis. And then uh, let me show you the main results we obtained with, uh, with several MRT collision model with a particular D2 and lattice. So here I show you the, the main scheme of uh, MRT collision model where here we have the, the collision matrix uh, where M is actually a moment matrix. So with the D2 and lattice, we have nine moments. So it's a nine moment matrix. And the, in the article, we tried several moments matrix, which are the, the raw moments, so that the, the main uh, standard moments, central moments, which are, the, which are the raw moments that are shifted by the flow velocity, and also hermit moments and central hermit moments. And uh, we also have S, which is the diagonal matrix, matrix of the matrix of the relaxation time. So here, the three first coefficients of this matrix have no influence because they are related to collision invariance. Uh, the three next ones, so S4 to S6, are related to the viscosity, so the bulk and the shear viscosity. And S7 to S9 have no, uh, ex um, are not expected to have any physical influence in the Navier-Stokes equation, so they are expected to have only a numerical uh, influence on the, on the simulation. And by performing the analysis of such a system, we can show that there is no influence of the choice of the moment matrix in the consistency with the Navier-Stokes equations, which means that all of these models recover the same equation at first order in constant number, so which is the, the order of the Navier-Stokes equation, which means that uh, working with a central basis, for example, does not correct the common Galilean invariance error. Another observation is that uh, exactly like regularized model, uh, MRT model suffer from a hyperviscosity, uh, hyperviscous degeneracy when delta T, the time step, is much larger than tau S. So where tau S is the, actually the relaxation time related to the shear viscosity. So here, this problem is exactly similar than what we've seen with the, with the regularization. So this degeneracy can lead to an unexpected dissipation and even uh, an instability uh, when delta, delta T is too large. And finally, uh, we can see that if we fix uh, the same value to the three numerical parameters, so we, if we set them to Sn, uh, we can find two particular values that are noticeable, which are first, uh, if we set Sn equals to two, we can see that the degeneracy is canceled. 
So here, uh, this particular value is quite interesting because uh, we have we quite recover a correct viscosity with uh, this model, uh, even when delta t is large. But in this particular case, we have non-hydrodynamic modes exactly like in the BGK case. So uh, nothing can tell us that uh, this model can be more stable than the BGK one. And if we set Sn equals to one, uh, this time the non-hydrodynamic modes are regularized because this model is exactly equivalent to a regularization, uh, especially when we work with the Hermit moment spaces. But in this case, we have a degeneracy, so exactly like in the, the projectile regularization case. So to conclude uh, on, this, uh, on this topic, so this uh, methodology um, here at presented a, a general methodology that can explain the behavior of several lattice Boltzmann schemes. And which is, uh, so is the originality of, it, of this work is uh, actually the systematic distinction between consistency errors and the numerical errors in the, in the scheme. And it helps uh, better understanding the role of several numerical parameters, such as the numerical parameters we have in MRT collision model. So uh, other collision models are also investigated in the article, such as the shear stress reconstruction of the hybrid recursive regularization from Jérôme Jacob, which is a model we quite appreciate here at uh, M2P2. Uh, we also focus on the true relaxation time model by Irina Gensburg, and also on the impact of the MAC correction by uh, Yung Yang Feng, and especially the way we discretize uh, the mass correction, so using a central scheme or a neprin scheme. And as for the, the perspective, uh, we uh, today plan to perform similar analysis to hybrid LBM for the investigation of compressible flows. And last but not least, uh, since the error is now explicitly known, uh, such a work can pave the way to possible correction so that we could uh, improve our collision models. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, I don't know if there are questions from the audience in the chat. I don't see. Ah, okay, yes, there is. Question. In practice, we can show that the cumulant approach also suffer from hyperviscosity degeneracy. Do you think this conclusion could uh, also be reached uh, with uh, your uh, me me methodology? Okay, so you mean that um, this, uh, hyper, so this hyper viscosity has been explicitly seen in simulations, I think. Uh, so yes, I think this, uh, there is no reason why it could not be uh, exhibited uh, with this methodology, which can actually be applied to any collision model. Okay. I have a curiosity if uh, you have observed uh, uh, the degeneracy also in the recursive uh, uh, hybrid uh, regularized collision. Yes. Okay. What's in that? Okay. Yes, actually. Okay. Uh, yes. And um, uh, in every, every regularization and also in every MRT mm. model, except in the, the particular case I, I showed you. Mm. And uh, the very um, uh, the, the main difference between all these schemes is that sometimes this hyperviscosity can be stabilizing or it can be destabilizing. So okay. when it is stabilizing, the model is over dissipative, and when it mm. is destabilizing, it is uh, unstable. Okay. Okay. Thank you again Thank you. for the presentation. So we can go ahead uh, with the next speaker, with, which is my friend Giacomo, uh, which is a presenting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon which is presenting a uh, talk with the title, which is uh, Lattice Boltzmann Me Method and uh, Nuclear Fu Fusion Report on a 25 year marriage. I think you have, you can already share the screen. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you can see my screen. I think okay. so. so okay, Marco, thank you very much for this very kind introduction, my friend. And uh, uh, I will talk to you about uh, this uh, marriage. Mm, this year, it's 25 years that the first uh, uh, paper uh, plated with the uh, fusion 
a term uh, on Ratis Boltzmann was issued. And uh, we will see some, uh, um, the background of this uh, marriage. We will see the state of the art uh, and some uh, perspectives. Okay, I would like you to, to consider this presentation as a, a discussion with you. Uh, we have just started in this field with some new ideas. And uh, uh, I would really like you to make some comments and to let me know uh, what you think about. And if you have other ideas, we can share them um, for, uh, for, the, for the future. OK, so just a very brief introduction. Uh, nuclear fusion is what happens inside the stars. And uh, it is the synthesis that happens in nature of uh, heavier elements uh, starting from um, lighter ones. Uh, it is quite curious, but until the 920, uh, 1920, excuse me, uh, no one knew uh, what happened inside stars. So this uh, seminal paper in science by Eddington was the first released uh, on the analysis of what happened inside the stars uh, with the, the uh, first ideas of the formulation of fusion, nuclear fusion. And uh, it was, it is dated by, it is dated in 1920. So uh, 101 years ago. Okay. The, um, the idea of bringing the sun on Earth is the key to unlimited power. Um, the nuclear energy has been exploited in, uh, this, uh, in the last century and this one, uh, mainly through fission, uh, in which heavy uranium atoms are broken into smaller ones with the release of energy, while uh, fusion is the opposite process in which lighter atoms are fused together to produce the uh, heavier um, components, heavy atoms, and release energy. Uh, two possible ways are known to achieve nuclear fusion on Earth. One through magnetic confinement, uh, using powerful magnets in order to confine the um, thoral uh, thread of plasma at the center of this uh, structure. This is the inside of the tokamak, uh, of one of the tokamaks. Or inertial confinement, you can achieve inertial confinement by using lasers, very powerful lasers, and uh, which are uh, used for very brief pulses in order to compress the fuel and start the fusion reaction, but containing it locally. Okay. Fusion is always very present in the media, but this uh, year, and especially across uh, summer, uh, many interesting uh, news uh, have populated the media all over the world. Uh, first, uh, the Chinese uh, tokamak um, was able to maintain for over 100, 100 seconds uh, 120 million degrees Celsius. The previous um, record was 100, uh, excuse me, yes, 100 million Celsius for one 100 seconds. Uh, so it uh, uh, overcame this record and then the um the Le Lawrence, Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratory was able to achieve 1.3 megajoule uh, megajoule of uh, energy uh, released and sustained in their tokamak however we are still far from the net energy production because uh, to achieve this 1.3 megajoule, uh, 2.4 were necessary to produce the plasma uh, thread, to the, 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 the plasma, yes, uh, thread, and uh, to cool uh, the, um, the reactor, okay? So this is mainly the problem of uh, fusion from an, an, a, 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 a plant power, um, power plant point of view. This is the section of the ITER Tokamak, uh, that is the, uh, the joint venture between 25 nations from China to Europe to India to Russia and uh, uh, Korea and the United States, uh, which is uh, being built in the south part of uh, France. And it is expected to uh, start up the first plasma in 2025. So we all are excited about this new uh, facility. And so this is a great opportunity, I believe, for the future of Europe and for the future of uh, sustainable and green uh, energy. So let's come back to LBM and fusion, nuclear fusion. Uh, 
the literature is overwhelming, so I must uh, stress that I will talk just about the very papers that are uh, um, meant and uh, uh, conceived to deal with the nuclear uh, fusion or also fission, because also in the fission section, we must consider LBM as a powerful tool. So the first um, paper to deal with uh, 3D uh, numerical simulations of plasma was this by Fogaccia, Benzi and Romanelli in 1996. So this is why I, uh, the title is 25 marriage, 25 year marriage. And they made this 3D analysis of the turbulent structures that were measured in the Tokamak test reactor and uh, they uh, before the end of the 80s beginning of the 90s uh, it was not clear if the uh, strongly confined uh, turbulence inside the tokamak uh, um, would uh, um, spark uh, 1d 2d or 3d turbulent structures and uh, Finally, 3D structures were measured, so a 3D algorithm was necessary to, um, to um, uh, um, uh, take into account, to account for the, all the complexity inside the tokamak. Okay, um, the fields of applications of Lattice Boltzmann can be grouped into these two. So it's a, a huge um, um, argument, a huge topic, but uh, essentially Lattice Boltzmann can provide a useful tool in these two for the computation of fluid dynamics, as always, uh, including isothermal or thermal flows inside the reactors, and in neutronics. Neutronics also was quite new for me, and uh, uh, it is very interesting, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, for uh, uh, the um, uh, Lattice Boltzmann uh, uh, as well. Okay. How can Lattice Boltzmann uh, deal uh, with the nuclear thermal flows? Uh, there are many recipes. I have grouped these ones, uh, and uh, essentially there are the, some, we, we can call broadly extensions of the collision operator. Uh, first of all, the entropic uh, uh, algorithm by Carling and his group, the regularization that we have seen, which is not strictly related to the collision operator operation in set, uh, itself, but uh, it, it intervenes uh, in, during the, the collision process, the two relaxation time, multiple relaxation time in general. Then we can use the uh, you, we can use uh, complex uh, uh, lattices. The multi-speed extension of LBM has been uh, uh, treated for the, in the last thirty years many times. However, it usually uh, is quite tricky and touchy and can uh, give rise to numerical instabilities. There is the multi-population approach in which uh, you solve the fluid dynamic properties with the F1 population and the thermal properties with G, uh, and they are conjugated with the, towards the local equilibrium. You can also use the passive scale and transport to, uh, to account for temperature evolution, but this is, uh, well, it can provide very exact and robust uh, um, predictions, but uh, maybe for the most complicated Mm, phenomena with the gener local localized generation of high temperatures, it's, it can um, bring to numerical instabilities as well as the multi-speed. And then there are the, I call them the engineering uh, approaches, the hybrid ones in which mm, the lattice Boltzmann is coupled with the finite element and the finite volume method. And these are uh, um, mm, approaches that are very common in the engineering field. And uh, they are called, uh, as I said, hybrid ones. Okay, so this is a very brief uh, outlook of thermal um, papers that have been published in the last 15 years and that are, as I said before, especially targeted for nuclear aspects. Okay, so for instance, they um, consider the fission uh, bars in the case of uh, um, fission, nuclear fission, uh, they're cooling the flux of uh, um, boiling water uh, into boiling water reactors, uh, the transition of boiling water from liquid to uh, vapor inside these reactors and so on and so forth. So uh, as you see, there is a, a wide um, uh, panorama, especially for what concerns the turbulence modeling, and uh, we will uh, share some thoughts on this. Um, there are 
most of all are based on the BGK, the single relaxation time, hybrid and MRT, and there are some um, most more advanced uh, um, algorithms that are especially designed for these types of uh, problems, characterized by localized lower Reynolds numbers and so on and so forth. Okay, so the main focus in the last two, de two decades, 15 years, let's say, is uh, uh, many the efforts have been uh, devoted to the mixing problem inside the vessel of the reactor. And this is uh, not um, a trivial uh, to understand the readings of the thermocouples in the actual, um, in, the, in the real scale uh, reactor. Okay, so from the real scale reactor, you uh, earn a reading from the thermocouples, but you don't know if these thermocouples provide you the temperature of which part of the plasma or the reactor chamber they give you the, the, the temperature, especially related to the problems uh, that are uh, due to the uh, strong radiation release. So um, there are many uh, papers focused uh, for the fission uh, reactors uh, on the uh, fuel and uh, um, uh, on the flux, excuse me, around the fuel roads. Uh, then the, the approach can be both uh, uh, thermal or athermal. And then there are many uh, papers on the turbulent regimes around these fuel roads, which is of great interest. Then um, there is the uh, problem of pebble recirculation associated with gas coolant in high temperature gas reactors. But this problem is the same also for fusion uh, reactors because the problem of uh, uh, cooling uh, usually is performed um, with the fusion reactors uh, with the injection of uh, uh, icy uh, deuterium chunks and so their transport within the, the plasma and, and their melting is very complex and uh, um, this is a problem that is uh, uh, ubiquitous in uh, um, fusion and fission. In fission, there is the simulation of liquid metals used in recent reactors, the problems of corrosion. Yudong Chen has started the, the um, treatment of uh, this problem with the lattice Boltzmann, uh, formation of CRUD, uh, deposition mechanisms, uh, um, possible fractures in the um, coolant uh, chamber, and uh, there is the problem of loss of coolant accident, uh, LOCA is called, uh, due to high, high temperature gradients. And uh, there is also another point that is very interesting that uh, Lattice Bosman can uh, face, uh, interestingly, is the formation of uh, flow acoustic resonances and uh, um, the fatigue that is generated in pipes due to these uh, um, uh, resonances. So we know that um, the basic Lattice Boltzmann is blindly, mildly compressible, and uh, we can uh, um, enhance this compressibility, of course, uh, and treat these aspects. Okay. Usually, um, some works uh, are related to the flux, the CFD simulations inside and around, for instance, the rods or inside the reactor, but do not use very sophisticated turbulence modelings models. Um, it is, um, however, um, possible to uh, simulate uh, complex phenomena without this turbulence uh, um, modeling using uh, higher discretization schemes or, of course, uh, bringing in turbulence through the LES, uh, which is the, the most uh, um, uh, used, uh, widely used um, uh, turbulence modeling in nuclear simulations. Um, more sophisticated models such as V-less and less whale are also used, leading to better results but than the simple LES, but they can give rise to numerical instabilities and numerical problems, especially related to the, um, to the lo um, local values, if they are not constant, or the uh, value in, in general of the um, relaxation time. Okay, the relevant inclusion of thermal field models uh, can be uh, performed in order to capture um, 
the complex heat transfer and uh, also species transport. Okay, sorry for I had a, a glitch in the in the transition. Okay, neutronics. Neutronics. What is neutronics? Neutronics is the basic uh, transport of neutrons or diffusion of neutrons inside the reactor. Okay, uh, in LBM, um, usually the collisions among neutrons are neglected, and neutron neutrons scatters scatter just uh, uh, within the media in which they propagate. Okay, with many different laws. Uh, the uh, equation, Boltzmann equation, uh, lattice Boltzmann equation, can be recast with uh, this psi, psi term and uh, some um, ad hoc uh, so, uh, sources. And we have, uh, sorry, okay, that uh, the summation of these prob prob um, probability density functions uh, provide uh, the neutron angular flux, which is this phi g, okay, with proper weights. These are again some of the most relevant works in neutronics performed with the lattice Boltzmann method in the last 15 years. And you see that neutronics is quite uh, um, another animal than standard CFD um, performed through the lattice Boltzmann because there are many other uh, uh, lattices that. For instance, personally, I was at all not used to. And uh, uh, these lattices are related to the scattering of neutrons inside the media. So, um, for instance, you can find the D1Q13, D1Q17 um, for the just one dimensional case. And uh, uh, they, they provide, of course, they, they, they work in the very same uh, way as our standard CFD uh, lattices, but uh, are a little bit more complex, okay? Just from a, a morphological point of view. In what uh, uh, LBM has been more uh, used for neutronics in these last 15 years? Uh, for calculations in complex geometry, uh, geometric arrays, uh, always uh, Lattice Boltzmann preserves its beautiful characteristics of flexibility in complex domains and uh, easy in dealing with uh, complex boundary conditions. Um, also in the presence of this different scattering absorbing media and also reflective media both for steady state and transient uh, treatments, okay? There are uh, both in, in the recent literature. There are also some, uh, re uh, the resolution of some critical problems related with time stability of the neutron flux. And there is also the interaction between uh, thermal field and uh, neutrons, okay? I give uh, at the end the details on all the bibliography because uh, it, it was huge. So call me if you need these, uh, uh, papers, I will give you all the details. So, uh, summing up for neutronics, LBM treats this complicated neuton transport as a simple linear calculations as always in uh, the same way as for fluid dynamics compared to Navier-Stokes. Uh, uses the angular discretization schemes uh, instead of the uh, velocity phase space, but the basics is always the same. In early solutions, in early works, the solutions were obtained through isotropic scattering, and this has been overcome also uh, in uh, recent, uh, more recent papers. Uh, there is the possibility of obtaining multi-group solutions with the 1D, 2D, and 3D simulations. And it is possible also in this case to provide, to produce some hybrid configurations, uh, with hybrid, uh, um, yes, uh, solvers uh, with finite volume uh, and uh, to achieve more uh, accurate results with mesh refinement. The uh, uh, recipe is always the same, uh, but the problem is that we have always to look at the computational cost because for the neutron scattering, uh, as I told you before, uh, you can face uh, much more complex um, lattices. So, uh, exactly. So, you have other DXQM um, lattices that provide the, the, the right conservation laws for neutron scattering. And uh, you, as, I told, as I told you before, you can end up in considering also uh, the finite volume method and uh, mesh refinement techniques to achieve more details. Okay, very briefly, uh, in the case of nuclear fusion, we must 
address also the problem of magnetohydrodynamics, uh, which is always present inside the, um, the reactors. And uh, LBM and the MHD have been married for even a longer time. In fact, uh, there are two seminal works uh, uh, by Shi Chen and Saurosucci, uh, dating back both in 1991, and uh, they treat uh, the Lattice Bosman uh, um, simulation of magnetohydrodynamic uh, uh, problems. And for instance, as I told you before, one of the sorry, one of the critical and unsolved problems uh, is the, the instabilities of plasma uh, inside the rea fusion reactor, which can be addressed through uh, magnetohydrodynamic equations. Uh, one of the uh, techniques, as I told you before, to control these instabilities is to inject these icy chunk particles, uh, icy chunks of deuterium, uh, but their uh, transport properties are very complex. In fact, I found, in fact, I found a, a trace uh, very recent in which supercomputations are carrying out, uh, are, are being carrying out to, um, um, to address this, this very complex problem. From our side, we started to the, the address magnetohydrodynamics through a very simple extension of the standard Shenzhen multi-phase um, uh, algorithm. You know, this is the basic uh, BGK with interaction, force interactions. Uh, these force interactions can address for chemical interaction, electromagnetic interaction, or also interface interactions. And so this is uh, the, the genial idea by Shan and Chen to provide a very simple uh, forcing uh, to address for these uh, interface interactions. We had the idea to make this uh, G, the uh, um, strength, the, the parameter of the strength of the interaction between the phases, variable in space and time by providing along a very simple D2Q9 uh, standard lattice, uh, uh, isotropic uh, uh, interactions along the direction 1, 3, 5, 6, and 7, 8, and just changing the 2, 4 um, direction with a delta G. This delta G can be easily uh, addressed with uh, uh, space variation, the accounting for liquid and vapor phases, and also time variations, OK? This is very, very simple, but provided interesting results. For instance, uh, for a liquid jet, we have performed some simulations in the past considering the formation of liquid jet and break up the rise of instabilities. Uh, for a very small Reynolds and Weber number and bond number, we define the magnetic bond number in which we define the effects of the magnetic pressure uh, against the capillary pressure. And we saw that at Reynolds 45, we do expect that the liquid comes out of the hole and of the hole, and then a, a bubble produces the ligament uh, stretches. And finally, if the domain is quite long enough, is, is long enough, the ligament can break up due to instabilities on the surface, uh, releasing this large droplet. In the presence of non-isotropic uh, forcing due to the presence of a, um, an external magnetic field, we found a dramatic different behavior of this liquid jet uh, also for a very small value of the Reynolds number. This is just a very um, uh, slow dripping phenomena should be, while it uh, encounters a catastrophic uh, breakup and deformation regime in the presence of uh, um, external magnetic fields. Okay, so um, in conclusion, um, LBM uh, has been widely used in these last 25 years and proves to be a very good candidate for a possible comprehensive framework. There is no comprehensive frameworks in nuclear fusion and fission treatment. So there is no one um, package, software package that deals with Newton transport, heat transfer, CFD, uh, transport and deposition mechanisms for uh, secondary chemical species, and so on and so forth. So Lattice Boswan proves very, a very interesting and powerful candidate for this. We then can have and can face potential remarkable um, um, 
outbreaks of uh, um, lattice Boltzmann, considering neutronics with um, complex um, behaviors uh, like the liquid gas transitions, but for neutrons, uh, the breakup that we saw, uh, and so on. Okay, so if you uh, need details on the bibliography, please write me because uh, th there were more than 100 uh, papers. I couldn't put the bibliography here, but I can let you have all the details and I have uh, finished. So thank you very much for your thank kind you. attention and I'm here thank for you, your Gia Gia Giacomo. We see if uh, there are questions. We are uh, maybe a bit late. Sorry for the... No, no. Being okay. okay, so probably we can move on. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, being... Marco. Thank Marco. you very much. Sorry for being long. <laughs> okay. So uh, we are approaching uh, at the end uh, of the session. Ecco mi. Scusatemi the tutti. speaker. Okay. And uh, the last speaker is uh, uh, Sin Wani Singh from yeah. the University of uh, Warwick, Coventry. Can I share uh, my screen now? Yes, I can give you, I have to give you the permission, okay, to share the screen. Okay, you can now share the screen. Try to share. Yes, we can see perfectly. Okay, the title is a class of numerical algorithm constructed along the lines of lattice Boltzmann method to derive to semi-derived polymer solutions. Yeah. Thanks. So, Please. first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving the opportunity to talk at DSFD. Today, I'm going to present a class of numerical algorithm, uh, which, uh, which is a multi, uh, which is based on a multi-scale model, and is constructed along the lattice Boltzmann kind of method. So, first, I'll give a little bit uh, background about why we want to study polymer solutions. So. A small amount of polymer, if present in a Newtonian fluid, is shown to reduce the draft substanti substantially and is found very useful in uh, transporting oil through large, long distances. So this phenomena is called drag reduction phenomena. A more recent uh, application of polymer is found uh, in uh, 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 enhanced oil recovery, where at, at a low Reynolds number where the flow is supposed to be laminar, when a polymer is added into the flow, it starts to show instabilities. And these instabilities facilitates the oil through the uh, torturous rock. So, how, uh, so I'll just provide a little bit detail of the model that we are using in this uh, scheme. So I'll, I'll consider a polymer dumbbell model in which two beads are connected through a spring. And to limit the uh, extensibility of the spring, we are considering finite, ext finitely extensible nonlinear elastic spring, which where you can see from here that the finite extensibility is limited to Q naught. So if a polymer is present in a fluid, it experiences the spring force, the drag due to the solvent and the fluctuation due to the temperature. Now, conventionally what is done is we solve the solvent part using a Navier-Stokes equation which include a contribution due to the polymer, uh, polymeric stress, like an extra stress. Now, now we need the information of the stress, so which we can find uh, through the constitutive model, which depends upon the second order moment of the end-to-end -end vector, which is Q here. So, but these equation are not closed. So in order to uh, make a close form constitutive equation, we need to do some uh, approximations. And while doing this approximation, we lose some physics behind the uh, model. So the Olroyd B model, which is based on the Hookean spring, does not reproduce the shear thinning effect of the polymer solution. And the other model, which are based on the pre-average approximation of Fini P and the other approximation, loses hysteresis uh, in uh, stress and strain when uh, we deal with the extensional flow. The other way could be to move to a Langevin approach in which instead of solving the conformation tensor, we solve the exact location of the beam. And 
This stochastic differential equation can be solved using a Brownian dynamics. But when the flow is weak, these Brownian dynamics become very expensive because in that limit, we need, uh, we need larger ensembles because the error is proportional to uh, one by root uh, n, where n is the number of ensembles. So what we are proposing here that uh, we use a two fluid theory in which a polymer solution uh, is supposed to be consisted of two phase. One, the polymer phase, which is the dumbbell. So it needs to be described by a two particle distribution function. The other phase is solvent. So a single, party, a single particle distribution function is sufficient. Now we will try to make polymer and solvent communicate at their uh, at the kinetic level through the distribution function and hope that we will get the desired continuum equations which are the total mass and uh, mass density conservation and the momentum density conservation so this is the objective so but since the collision between polymer and polymer which is now a two particle distribution function and the solvent which is a single particle distribution function so the coll collision is not so easy to define the observables for momentum, mass density and momentum density, uh, zeroth order uh, moment and the first order moment is sufficient. But in order to define the mass density of the polymer phase, we need to take care of the collisions happening between the bead one at location X, as well as bead two at the location X. So similarly, we need to define the momentum density also carefully. So now this picture is, in, to model collision in this picture is non-trivial. Uh, so before going into the model that we are using, I will briefly describe how it is done in binary gas mixture. So in binary gas mixture, we need to take care of the collision be happening between particle A and A, particle B and B, and particle A and B. And any kinetic description should be such that it accounts for the self-collision as well as the cross-collision. The self-collision should conserve uh, mass density, momentum density, and the energy density. And the cross-collision should be such that, that the total momentum and the total energy of the system should be conserved. And at the momentum density level, we, need, uh, we should get a, a drag kind of uh, a term. We should vanish when we add these equations. So in order to model this type of system, there, uh, there is already a, a a collision model, which is based on two-step relaxation collision in which the first, the distribution function relaxes to an intermediate step with suppose tau df, and then uh, relaxes to an equilibrium uh, state with tau viscosity, where tau df is, corresponds to the relax, uh, corresponds to the diffu diffusivity and this, uh, this relaxation time corresponds to the viscosity of the total solution. And this was proposed in 2006. So we, be, uh, we use the similar kind of two-step relaxation scheme to define the collisions happening between polymer and solvent, where both, both of them know each other through the total momentum of the system. So before, uh, 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 without going into the detail, I'll just put the expression here and say that it is based on the, uh, in the same way we, uh, on which binary gas mixture collision term was based. Okay, now we derive the moments. So we see that the mass density of the polymer phase is conserved, momentum density of the, oh, sorry, mass density of the solvent phase is conserved. And the, in the momentum density, we see a term which vanishes if we add these two equations. So the total momentum density is conserved. And we see an extra term theta here in the momentum density, which comes out because the polymer is connected through a uh, spring. So this is, this is related to the uh, elastic stress of the polymer. Now, how we model this in the lattice Boltzmann method. So I'll briefly describe uh, what is uh, Boltzmann equation. So in Boltzmann equation, uh, the collision term pushes the distribution function to its equilibrium state at the rate of fun by tau, where tau is related to the viscosity. Multiscale Chapman says that we will get Navier-Stokes equation at a very small tau. And to discretize it, we, we consider a discrete velocity set 
corresponding to the discrete uh, distribution set. And the algorithm is very easy then, collide according to the collision rule and then stream to the next uh, uh, site according to the velocity. So for the solvent phase, uh, so we are considering a two dimensional problem and uh, modeling solvent with the D2Q9 watt model, which consists of the zeroth velocity and the neighboring velocity and the next nearest neighbor. Now, to recall now, our polymer is described by a two particle distribution function. So in order to solve a two dimensional problem, we need to consider a four dimensional lattice. So how I uh, visualize this is that there is a two dimensional lattice for polymer and at each node, there is, an, there is another two dimensional lattice which controls the conformation of the polymer. And so we, we are considering D4, Q25 lattice and these are the discrete velocities for this lattice. Now, uh, so we are considering a two dimensional Kolmogorov float for the benchmarking. So Kolmogorov flow is basically a cosine force in Y along the X direction. Uh, and the system size is two pi cross two pi. So in the Newtonian flow limit, uh, we see that the instability arises when the Reynolds number crosses root two. So we are considering two cases. One, when there is already an instability. So we are considering Reynolds 3.5. And you can see at Weisenberg, Point one, where the feedback of the polymer is very small, we can see there is instabilities. And as we increase the, so these are the vorticity profile. So as we increase the uh, Weisenberg number, we see that these instabilities are dying and completely vanishing at higher Weisenberg number. So this corresponds to the so-called drag reduction phenomena. So we can see that this has reached a laminar state. But if we further increase the Weisenberg number, the elastic effect dominates, starts to dominate, and we see the instability, which are purely elastic in nature. Now, the, we consider other case, which is Reynolds 1. So at this uh, Reynolds number, there, is, there should be no uh, instabilities in the flow. But we see in the presence of polymer at Weizenberg number 7.5, we see to start wave like uh, we see uh, we starts to see wave like instabilities and their magnitude grows as we further increase the Weisenberg number. Now here I want to point out in constitutive model the polymer density is always uh, assumed to be constant but here in our uh, uh, kinetic approach we have uh, control over the conformation density so we can actually calculate. So this, this equation is uh, came out of the governing equation if we integrate out the velocity degrees of freedom. And if we further integrate out the conformation degrees of freedom, which are Q, we get the uh, number density, equation for the number density. And so for the laminar case, for example, uh, I have plotted a cosine forces uh, forcing, which we are using in this, uh, in this simulation and see that the uh, uh, gradient profile here and see that the polymer is concentrating in the minimum gradient region and the extension of the polymer is aligned with the flow. And so when we have higher Weisenberg number, we see that when we start to see the wave kind of uh, flow, we see that the polymer starts to align in the region of uh, uh, lower gradient, which will fall along the lines where the wave starts to appear and it's uh, where it starts to deviate from the laminar nature. And the, uh, and the maximum extension is aligning align in the field of the minimum polymer density. So to study it further, we have plotted the root mean extension uh, of the polymer with time. And we see that at a lower Weisenberg number, uh, as the Weisenberg is increasing, Weisenberg corresponds to the elasticity of the polymer. We see that it, uh, the mean extension saturates, but it's increasing. And at higher Weisenberg number, with the appearance of the wave function, we see that the extension is also showing a BV structure. And we plotted the uh, time average extension with Weisenberg number, and we see that only, if the polymeric extension is 
extended to a, uh, towards a double the value of its mean extension, it is sufficient to see that, uh, to see the elastic turbulence. Okay. So we, we, are, we were able to qualitatively capture both the drag reduction and the elastic turbulence phenomena using a lattice, uh, using a method based on lattice Boseman approach. So right now I'm doing a comparative study with the constitutive model like Fini P. And the future, in the future, I want to extend this method for the multiphase and the multiphysics flows to actually realize the real, uh, real life phenomena like enhanced oil recovery and enhanced heat transfer. With this, I will finish my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we check if there are questions from the audience. Yes. Professor ba Wagner, please. Yeah, maybe I can just speak here. Uh, it's a beautiful talk. Um, I, I'm not sure I com completely understood um, some of the graphs that you showed me were showing these, these, these laminar structures, right? What did yeah. the colors represent there? Oh, oh, okay, I'll share my screen again then. Oh. You mean this, these one? Yeah, for instance. So these are the values of the vorticity, like minus two plus. The red are min uh, plus and the blues are minus. So what's the underlying flow profile? Is it the Poisson profile or what's the underlying flow, flow profile? It's a Kolmogorov flow. It's a what, sorry? Kolmogorov flow, two-dimensional Kolmogorov flow. So it's a cosine okay. thing in X direction, cosine okay. Y direction. So if there is no, so if it is a Newtonian flow, we will get a profile like this, like we see mm -hmm. here at five. Yeah. So if it's a laminar flow. So my objective was through this picture, my objective was to show that these are the instable instabilities and it dies and it becomes laminar. So which is saying that mm -hmm. uh, the poly addition of polymer is uh, killing the instabilities, mm -hmm. which is the drag, so-called drag reduction phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So I chose this two-dimensional Kolmogorov flow because it seemed easy and it, it was able to capture the basic uh, uh, things that polymer shows. Yeah, very nice. I had one more question uh, regarding the computational efficiency. So for this 2D problem, now you have to solve a 4D lattice, right? Yes. Yes. How expensive is that? Okay, so I don't have a comparative study, but I can give you some numbers. So for eight to 16 cores, I need one to two days to, the, uh, to reach a steady state solution. Mm -hmm. So I would say that since my code is not properly optimized yet, so I would say that that's not a very high uh, computation cost considering if we use a confacet kind of thing uh, system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. I think for... <clears throat> Uh, today it's uh, finished the session. I want just to remember to all the audience that uh, tomorrow we will start uh, at 9 uh, and 40 p.m. with a plenary talk uh, given by the speaker Matteo Lulli. Then uh, we will continue with uh, the two uh, technical sessions at uh, the same time, advanced method in uh, room uh, Leone, while uh, uh, we will have the, the technical session on the topic uh, complex flow in uh, uh, room Palma. Thank you again to all the speakers. Thank you to all the all, all audience. And uh, for today is everything. See you tomorrow morning. Thank you very much again. And have a, a nice evening.